Uh, can I call the meeting to order, please? Uh, Chair, we live. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a, a, a slight remnant of a cough, so forgive me if I sound hoarse or start coughing through the meeting. Uh, it's a warm welcome to those attending and also to the viewers watching live on the Council YouTube, Hillingdon, London. My name is Councillor Higgins and I am the Chairman of the Planning Committee. Details of business to be considered today are shown on the agenda, copies of which are available in the room. The agenda is also accessible online under the live broadcast. For those present in the room and attending to speak, please note you will be filmed and any statement you make will be recorded and made public. For those solely observing in the room today, you may wish to know that the camera is angled away from the public gallery where you are sitting. A reminder to everybody speaking today that your voice will only be heard and audible online if the microphone is switched off on. Uh, we're not expecting a fire alarm, so if one does go off, please follow officers out of the building. Um, mobile and tablet advice, uh, advice, um, devices, please can you make sure they're on silent? Um, obviously, some of the officers will be using theirs to look at agendas. Um, that's that. Now I will introduce the committee. Um, Councillor Alan Bennett, my <laughs> Vice-Chairman. Councillor Fahid Chibador, who's a substitute. Hey, welcome. Um, Councillor Darren Davis, Councillor Gaelic, Councillor Mand, and Councillor Singh, all welcome. Uh, my officers today, uh, we we'll start with the planning team first, is uh, Dr. Alan Tilly, who's the transport and uh, planning manager. Then we have Owen Concannon, who is a, a new officer, welcome, nice to see you for your first meeting, uh, team manager. I've got uh, Kate Crosby, who is the Area Planning Service Manager for the North, and I have Ed Loughton, who's the Area Planning Service Manager for Central and South. It's a bit complicated, and there is another one somewhere for the majors, but we're, we're, they're not here today. And also, in the on, on at the substitute bench at the back there, we have Richard uh, Hayden Richardson, who will be joining us shortly after his application comes forward. To my left, I have my uh, legal advice, which is uh, Jimmy Walsh. Welcome. Thank you. And the most important person here today is Liz, who is the Democratic uh, Service, who makes sure that we run this committee in the right way. So the first thing's for us, we go for absent, uh, apologies for absence, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, apologies are received from Councillor Roy Chamdal with Councillor Ch uh, Farhad Chubidar substituting. Thank Welcome. You. Uh, declaration of interest in matters coming before us, Councillor Bennett. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So, um, agenda item 9, Dyson Drive in Uxbridge, is actually in Hillingdon West Ward, not Uxbridge, as on the paper. Um, I live in the road adjacent, so I will step out for the discussion and vote. Thank you very much. Uh, can I, uh, the, to receive the minutes of a previous meeting, have they agreed? Yep. Yeah. No changes to it? Fantastic. Uh, matters that have been notified in advance or urgent, there isn't at the moment. All items of business are marked part one, there's nothing in part two to consider. Um, so we'll get started straight away. I think I've covered all my bases. Uh, the first application is 32 Norwich Road, Northward. Uh, Katie, you will do that one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Okay, so the first item on tonight's agenda is at 32 Norwich Road in Northwood. The proposal is to demolish the existing two-storey dwelling on site and construct a two-and-a-half-storey building comprising three flats with uh, car parking, amenity space and then bin and cycle storage. So if we have a look at the location plan here, you can see it's a corner site, bird's eye view. Okay, in terms of constraints, the site is not within a conservation area or an area of special local character. Um, in terms of the existing site plan, you can see here that um, it's, it's a two-storey building with accommodation in the roof space uh, with a crown roof. If we just flick quickly through the elevation drawings as well. And then if we move on to the site photos, it's easier to see what's on site there. So this is the front elevation of the building. So you can see to the front there is a bus stop clearway. Well, this is uh, to the right and of the um, of the subject site. So this is the front elevations of the subject site and then the uh, semi-detached dwellings next door. Uh, this is looking down Cranbourne Road and this is 
Again, down Cranbourne Road, looking back towards the application site. So you can see the rear elevation of the application site there. You can also see in this photo the existing dropped curb and vehicle access at the rear of the property, which is um, being retained as part of this proposal. Okay, it's just looking um, in the other direction. This is a rear elevation of the site. And just um, from the back of the property, looking towards number um, two, Cranbourne Road. So this is the side elevation of the neighbour at the rear. So you can see um, it's got high level windows there. Okay, and this is the front elevation of two, Cranbourne Road. Okay, so in terms of what's being proposed, this is the proposed block plan. So you can see that the layout will be pretty similar to what's existing on site. Uh, this is it. Um, this site plan, so you can see uh, the existing access to the rear is being used for parking spaces. There'll be two parking spaces proposed. Th sorry, three parking spaces proposed for the three proposed dwellings. Um, if we look, this is just another um, version of the site plan. So you can see, if you can see on the drawing to the the left hand side there, um, the red dash outline is the existing the existing footprint of the building on site. So you can see it's pretty similar in scale. And then on the right hand side, it shows a 45 degree line from the rear elevation window of the neighboring property. So it's clear of that. Um, landscape plan. Okay, so these are the proposed floor plans and elevations. So as you can see, it's um, pretty similar to what's uh, down the street. So you've got hipped roofs, you've got uh, dormer to the front and dormer to the rear, which is also um, what's existing. And that's the street scene elevation there, so you can see it in relation to um, the neighbouring properties on Norwich Road, which is, you can see there, it slopes slightly from east to west. Okay, and this is another street scene um, taken from Cranbourne Road, so you can see number two there. Okay, so this, um, members may remember this one, it is a resubmission of a previous application that was refused at Planning Committee. So the, it's since planet well since it was previously refused it has been uh, amended substantially so it has been reduced significantly so as you can see here the previous application was for eight flats on site and now it's been reduced to three and there was also a second um, crossover proposed to the front um, on Norwich Road which would have um, impacted the clearway for the bus stop. Okay, so this is the previously refused site plan. It says you can see there the site coverage was a lot larger. Okay, um, previously proposed ground floor plans. And these are the elevations. So the one on the left is the proposed elevation for Norwich Road. The one on the right hand side is the one taken from Cranbourne Road. So you can see that it is substantially, well, quite very significantly different from the previous, previously refused application. So this is the proposal that's currently before us. So the previous one was refused, um, just to summarise, for eight reasons. And it was largely to do with the overdevelopment of site, so it resulted in harm to the character and appearance of the area. It had impacts on neighbouring immunity. Uh, there was a loss of a family-sized dwelling. Um, and with this proposal, they are proposing a three-bed flat as well. And so we've got the larger dwelling there proposed. It also had uh, poor quality living accommodations, um, poor garden amenity, um, the highway safety issues that I raised previously with um, impact on the um, bus clearance way to the front, and it didn't provide cycle parking, sufficient cycle parking, and also um, it didn't it didn't show accessible or adaptable housing. So with the proposal that's before us tonight. Um, all these matters are considered, they've been addressed and therefore officers recommend approval. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, we have a petition. Mr Gregory Broadhurst, are you here? No? Oh, that saved us a lot of time. Okay, uh, next one is the applicant and agent, uh, Mr Kent. Yes, could you come sit down, please? Right, you have five minutes. Um, we have a traffic light system. Uh, four minutes will be green, one will be amber, and when it gets to red, I will stop you. And I will stop you. So don't think I'm, I'm, I'm not apologising, but I will stop you. So, okay, so whenever you're ready. 
Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Joseph Kent. I'm a director and town planner at Amasea Architects, and I led the design for 32 Norwich Road on behalf of the applicant. The proposal before you is a result of extensive engagement with Hillington Council, and for that reason, I would, I would like to start by thanking the officers for working proactively with the applicant and I in order to reach a positive recommendation. During the course of this application, consultation with the urban design officer identified areas of concern with the initial design which have since been resolved through comprehensive negotiations. These included revising the roof profile, the removal of balconies and the provision of separate private amenity space for the ground floor flat. Having reviewed the committee report, I am satisfied with its contents and proposed planning conditions. Nonetheless, I am conscious of public sentiment and I would like to take this opportunity to address some of the objections by local residents. While many of these were directed towards the initial design, the following were notable. Firstly, highways and parking. Many of the objections raised were concerning the impact to local roads. It was evident during my preliminary site visit that on-street parking is prevalent along both Norwich Road and Cranbourne Road. Thus, it stood to reason that the proposed quantum of development would have to be informed by the number of off-street parking spaces that could be reasonably accommodated within the site. The design process became a balancing exercise between parking and amenity space provision, from which I determined that three parking spaces would be feasible, served by an existing access point from Cranbourne Road. The proposal before you is for three dwellings assigned one parking space each. As set out in the committee report, this complies with both Hillingdon and London-wide parking standards. The highways officer has also stated that the proposal would not result in a significant increase in peak period traffic movements. Furthermore, the proposal provides secure par cycle parking for two bicycles per flat, which encourages alternative means of travel. Secondly, the demolition of the existing building. It was suggested by some that the existing house should not be demolished and be converted instead. Whilst it is noted that the revised design is of similar scale to the existing house, the proposal provides internal amenity, accessibility and space standards that comply with the latest planning requirements and building regulations which otherwise may not be as achievable in a conversion. Nonetheless, as stated within the committee report, there are no policies specifically preventing demolition and replacement of the existing dwelling, and the proposal must be determined on its own merit. And thirdly, setting a precedent. There has been some concern that, if approved, the proposal will give rise to other nearby sites being redeveloped from houses into flats. This is already a borough-wide matter identified by Hillington Council and is addressed by policy DMH4 of the Local Plan Part 2 Development Management Policies, which limits the number of properties on a residential street that may be redeveloped or converted into new blocks of flats. In any case, the potential for future redevelopment of sites beyond the applicant's control cannot warrant a refusal of this application. For the reasons I have set out, in addition to those within the committee report, I trust that the committee will agree with the officer's recommendation and approve the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kent. Mr. Zach, does any uh, councillors wish to have a question? No? Thank you very much. You may go sit down. Thank you. Right. So who is going to take me away? No, all rush at once. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I have a question which I'm hoping Dr. Tilly will be able to help. Um, could you let me know what the total number of residents parking is within the area at the moment around this development? I know it's a tricky one. I love a curveball. <laughs> Googly. We don't play baseball here. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, as anticipated, that's a very difficult question to ask, answer. Um, but I can confirm that there are no parking restrictions in the area and that would indicate that residents aren't approaching the council asking for a parking management scheme to be introduced, a parking management scheme being a good indicator of parking stress. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr Tilly. O obviously, can you give us the PTAL rating of, of that area as well? Please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. It's PTAL 2, which is poor compared to London as a whole. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Dennis Davis? Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's a shame the petitioner hasn't hasn't arrived today, because we may have had a few more questions. But such as be it. With the information that we have here at the moment, I can't see any reason not to move with officers' recommendations. Okay. Thank you. So, so I have a proposal, yeah, Councillor Bennett. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I echo Councillor Davis's view around the petitioner. It's just a real shame that there wasn't a written submission in lieu of the petitioner being here, because that may have teased out some, some more questions. Um, I, I think there's been great progress with this. Um, I think the applicant and council officers deserve praise for you know, really yep. reworking the design. There's a significant reduction in the number of flats. I think just by that alone, that's addressed a lot of the petitioner's concerns and, and, and some of the, the, the key comments that they'd made you know, around strain on infrastructure. I think we've been able to disprove that. Uh, diminishing of property values is completely out of scope of, of what we would assess. So on that basis, I'm happy to uh, second officer's yep. recommendation for I approval. Think, I think all those echo those, those sentiments exactly. The design is a lot better for the area. It looks m more in keeping rather than something from Miami Vice before. But uh, we'll go for that. So I'm proposing second. Can I have a show of hands of votes? Those in favour of officer's recommendation? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. The second one now is uh, number 12, Morello Avenue, uh, presented by Owen. There is, uh, can committee be aware that um, document B, agenda B, is available, so which is on your packs anyway, but just to make sure that the full report came a little bit late. So, whenever you're ready, Owen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Right, the next proposal is uh, seeks planning permission for a change of use from C3 uh, dwelling house to uh, a HMO including associated parking and cycle storage. Um, the application is, site is located to the southeast of Morella Avenue and comprises a uh, two-storey semi-detached property. Um, Planning permission has previously been re received in 2023 for a uh, part single, part two-storey uh, rear extension uh, together with front front porch, uh, which has recently been completed. Um, in the next side, you see the actual uh, bird bird side view, uh, followed by the aerial of the uh, Morella Road or Avenue. Um, in the wider context, as can be seen, it lies to the north of uh, West Drayton Road. Um, also, n note that the properties in the immediate area are quite uh, largely spacious, semi-detached and detached properties. So this is the constraints plan. Um, it is not within any designated areas. However, there is an Article 4 restriction on the site from conversion of dwelling houses uh, to C4 small uh, house in multiple occupancy. Um, as such, this is the reason for the application coming forward. Um, just also to make you aware that it is has a PTAL score of 2. So, this is the block plan. Um, on you can see the um, recently uh, approved extension at the back, which has been uh, constructed. In terms of the existing plans, um, you can see on the ground floor it's largely made up of living quarters, um, which kitchen diner facing the rear garden and living room to the front, uh, with three bedrooms and bathroom uh, at first floor level and en suite uh, in the loft. And this is the proposed plans. Um, the proposed plans sh uh, shows uh, a layout of five bedrooms. Um, in terms of uh, there are two bedrooms on ground floor, uh, one face in the front and the other to the rear. Uh, with a communal uh, kitchen area on the left-hand side. At first floor, it would also include two en-suite um, bedrooms and a small commu communal kitchen space uh, in the midsection of the first floor section. And then on the top uh, plan, you have a further en-suite. It must be added, these, these plans have been amended during the course of the application. It was initially for six uh, bedrooms. So in terms of proposed elevations, there, there are no uh, external changes to the building. Um, there are uh, 
um, cycle storage within within the garden space. And that's the application site, um, which, uh, in the context of the neighbours, with, with um, 14 Morella uh, on the left and number 10 on the right. And that's the uh, site in, in, in terms of uh, the recently uh, approved uh, planning permission. In terms of the assessment, uh, DMH5 uh, deals specifically with HMOs. Um, Part B of the policy deals with Article 4 controlled areas. That's uh, where permitted development rights uh, to convert small houses have been removed. In these areas, it does allow a uh, limited amount of conversions, um, uh, up to uh, 20%. However, one par however, the policy also says the accommodation must also comply with all other planning standards related to car parking, waste storage, retention of amenity space and garages, um, as well as uh, uh, impact on residential amenity of adjoining properties. Um, the supporting text of this uh, says where there is intensive occupation of former family dwellings such as student accommodation or HMO that could have a negative impact on amenity within the area. Um, uh, in, in terms of residential amenity, parking, loss of uh, front gardens, reduction of in levels of privacy or alterations uh, to buildings, it could represent a, a reason to refuse. In terms of layout, whilst the applicant has applied for a small-scale HMO up to five persons, um, on review of the plan submitted as well as uh, recent appeal decisions on the street, officers would consider the layout uh, an overall size of each bedroom within the property more akin to a, a, a large sui genera, gen, generis HMO. So um, in terms of the next table just gives you an idea of each of the, the bedroom sizes. Um, you have a front ground uh, which is uh, 17 square metres, uh, the back uh, is 27 square metres and the loft is uh, approximately uh, 29 square metres. Um, these would be quite suitable for two-person accommodation, um, and it could potentially be accommodated by up to 10 persons. This intensification of the use within the building over and above the present expectations along the street would cause harm to the local area. As such, officers considered the principle unacceptable, uh, which represents reason number one. Turning to neighbours' amenity, uh, officers would make reference to a recent appeal decision at 31 Morello Avenue, which detailed in the amenity section of the report, um, the inspector commented that the appeal property at 31 um, could be used up to uh, 11 persons with no controls proposed given the overall size of the bedrooms. In, in, in his uh, statement, he did say that it would be a significant intensification of the use of the property compared to the single family dwelling, having regard also to the likely transient nature of the occupation of the property. Um, this could uh, be expected to result in great greatly increased numbers of comings and goings um, and it was dismissed on, on amenity grounds. So that represents uh, reason, reason number uh, two uh, for in terms of our uh, um, report. The site has provided two car parking spaces and potentially for an, uh, another space <coughs> The highways officer had initially raised concerns in their observations given the bedrooms could potentially be accommodated by a larger number of people. In such instances, uh, transport appraisal and travel plan would be required and potential for a large number of spaces needed. In the absence of this information, uh, information officer consider 
the proposal failed to provide sufficient parking or a travel plan to ensure protection of the highway network and prevent congestion and pressures on the street parking. That represents reason number three. And finally, um, in, in terms of the overall standards of accommodation, while, while the bedroom sizes are quite large, um, there is limited communal space with only one small space at ground floor and uh, an additional uh, kitchen space at first. This overall layout of the room would also be have the potential uh, to impact the bedroom to the rear with noise transfer. Collectively, these issues would lead to a substandard form of accommodation for future occupants, and this represents reason number four. In summary, the application would not be acceptable in principle given the layout, which is more akin to a large HMO, which could cause impact on neighbour immunity, and given the lack of parking and poor layout, it would be contrary to our planning policies and recommend it for refusal. Thank you, Owen. It's a, a good report to stress out what HMOs are. I think as residents, they, a lot of people are quite fearful of, of these. And uh, Anyway, we have uh, the petitioner, uh, Kay Kalassi, is that, is that correct? Have I pronounced that totally wrong, probably? Forgive me, please. It doesn't help. I don't put my glasses on either, so just sorry about that. Okay, sir, so I'm sure you heard what I said before. Five minutes. Yeah. Uh, four green, one amber, and you're finished. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. Um, so, I'm Mr. Kelsey. Um, I live at number 10 Morello Avenue. Um, and just so I've read the rep um, planning officer's report, and um, which sort of mm -hmm. largely reflected the concerns. The neighbours had of, of the impact of this on on the residents and the local area, um, and so um, overall we welcome the recommendation to refuse permission to this um, um, application. And just to reiterate a couple of points from the report, so Morello Avenue is a uh, quiet residential area um, where most of the houses are occupied by families, um, so in this HMO just wouldn't be suitable to be in that area. Um, so yeah, so you, even the residents unanimously opposed the HMO application. Um, and then um, just one f final point, so I, s I submitted some pictures and this related to an incident that happened in our back garden where <coughs> The, the, the fences were removed and the owners came into our garden and cut down the tree. I mean, this isn't directly related to planning, but it's more sort of the in, in, intent they had um, of you know, not considering the impact of their decisions on the neighbours. Um, so they, they came into a house that, that, and cut the tree down in our garden, which was quite... Um, yeah, it, it was quite upsetting for us. But the, the point I want to make is, if, if they're doing this, it doesn't sort of bode well for how the actual accommodation will be run. Um, I mean, we, we talk about potentially 10 people in the accommodation. That could easily be 12, 15, or any number without any controls. Um, and that would have a, a real detriment to us uh, next door and to the other residents as well. So we strongly opposed this application and um, welcomed the decision that was proposed. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Just one sec. Um, I don't have many powers as a chairman, but what I will do is I will ask the enforcement team to look into that when they come into your property and cut your tree down. So um, that's when that I'll when pass it on to officers and see what we can do. Uh, without TPO, probably very not very much, but at least we'll have a look at it. Has anybody else got any other questions? With that, yes, Councillor. Um, but she was actually on your property. Yes. So legally, the tree was your property as well. So you had a loss. Yes. Have you initiated 
court proceedings, small claims? I'd rather not go into the court proceedings. I, I, sent, the, I sent the owner a picture of the tree and um, you know, things and what the cost would be, but I didn't go ahead with yeah. going into legal proceedings. I mean, it's not a route yeah. I want to follow. I'd, I'd rather res try and resolve it. Things with him. Unfortunately, <laughs> it is a civil matter, so you have to be very careful here, but I will just pass it on. They yeah. probably can't do very much, but I think out of a gesture of goodwill that I can do that, so I'm going to do that for you. Okay? Okay, any other questions? No. I'll turn your microphone. Um, thank you. You may go back to your seat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have a written response from the applicant and agent. Do you want to read that when you're ready? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so from the agent in, in respect to this item. Um, dear committee, I would like to start by thanking Owen for his help. He has got in touch when needed, and I appreciate this as the architect working on projects in the area. I would like to take this time to put across my view regarding this application and also highlight the key points that have led us here. Max was the first planner. He was also very helpful and communicative. We emailed regularly and discussed matters on the phone. Before I point out my key issue, I would like to address some smaller issues. Number one, parking has been raised as a problem. However, Max asked us to change the plans to show less spaces, two instead of three. Number two, being akin to a large HMO seems to be an assumption, and I would like to object to what is essentially hearsay. We cannot have a planning system that is making assumptions. Number three, as discussed with Owen, we will happily change the lay layout to make the whole downstairs living space with the bedrooms upstairs. We already took the stance. We are flexible with the design and want to make sure the council are happy. I understand when I was speaking with Owen, it was too late to submit changes. All the above issues from my point of view become inconsequential in light of the main issue highlighted below. The reason this is going through planning in the first place, as opposed to being allowed without planning, is the Article 4 that is in place. The Hillington website regarding Article 4 reads as follows. An Article 4 direction does not prevent the development but instead requires planning permission to be obtained first from the Council. This does not imply that the Council will either approve or refuse the planning application. Does not prevent development being in bold on the website. Now we move on to the Article 4 notice and the Council's description. The Article 4 is to remove permitted development rights relating to the change of use of a dwelling house, Class C3, into a house of multiple occup occupancy, HMO. The Council's report then states the reasons why an HMO would be refused. We do not hit a single criteria of this. As discussed with Max, the Article 4 is to stop the overcrowding of HMOs and there is not a single one on the street. To add to this point, the Council also agrees HMOs are needed for the University and the Hospital. The Council and Petitions argument is based on one thing and one thing only, the assumption that six or more people will live here, and this assumption is carried through the whole application. We are categorically submitting this as a five-person HMO. There are houses with the same size living areas for the same amount of people. How can a petition and planning refusal be based on taking away the rights of people with a lower socio-economic socio standing? The future inhabitants will not be able to afford £500,000 homes in the area, but they may want more than the minimum space required by the Council. I do not agree with the stance of taking away people's rights to equality, and I do not agree that the Council has the right to dictate that these people are forced into minimum sized units, while the people who can afford houses are allowed to live with six or more people in the same size houses and have larger bedrooms because they have more money. This is simply discrimination of wealth and class backed up by nimbyism. I implore you to see justice. In summary, we are happy to accept a limit of five people and have this enforced and conditioned. We are not accepting discrimination of future inhabitants and have their right to a comfortable and affordable life dictated on assumptions <coughs> and prejudice of the neighbours and council. I understand these are powerful words and I do not want to come across as combative. I fully accept the petition and the planning process to get a fair result but I feel so strongly about the topic of fighting for people's rights and to give them a chance at equality. I feel we have put forward enough information for the application to be passed. If the assumptions of the petition and council are agreed with, we will appeal and also consider legal action. Thank you all very much for your time, and I hope you see our points. And that's from Mr Graucott, who is the agent for the application. Okay. Thank you. I have to be careful what I say here. 
Councillor Goldhill, I believe you would like to speak on this application. And because you're a wordsmith, you only get three minutes. Yes? Thank you, Chair, for those three minutes. I'll cherish them. <laughs> um, in short, uh, thank you to the officers for the presentation you put forward here. Um, it's clear that this house is a lovely house. It's a lovely house on a lovely road filled with lovely families and to then change this house into an HMO which can go up to up to sort of 10 people is is just an awful is just an awful idea. Um I have you know I I could I could go over the the refusal points that the officers laid out and just explain the four refusal points here. Um, but I think the officers did a great job of explaining that, so I'll leave that there. I will pick up on one bit, and I say this as I'm the, I'm the last person you can ever call a NIMBY. But that being said, um, the, the uh, applicant put forward a, um, put forward a statement, um, and I'm surprised he didn't also read what the um, plans of the council are and what the ambitions of the council are, and that is to build nice build and maintain nice family homes and HMO doesn't fit into that category. Um, um, I'm mainly, the main reason I'm here, Chair, is uh, for Mr and Mrs Kelsey at number 10 and the residents of Morello Avenue who through the last year have gone through hell. Um, you know, they've been long-standing residents for a long time and to have uh, their, their property destructed and um, ongoing noise across the hours, um, across the permitted hours as well. And un uncertainty across the, um, about this application has been awful for them. Um, I, I'd like to point out one. I'd like to see if the committee would consider strengthening point number two. And I'd like to, the reason for doing that, I'd like to point to num point seven point zero eight, and specifically the part of the part of that that says um, paragraph one three five of the MPPF. Um, states planning policies and decisions should ensure that developments create places that are safe, inclusive and accessible which promote health and well-being. Um, I don't believe this HMO does that at all and I'd, um, it's briefly mentioned in point number two but I wonder if it, were, if it were to be an additional refusal reason or strengthening of point number two. Um, if, if the committee is thinking in any other way or voting in any other way I implore you to ask me any questions on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. What we'll do is, um, obviously, I saw they whisper in my ear. It's not, not I'm very clever. But what they will do is they will um, they will refer to that article so it's in in the report for you. Okay. Has anybody got any quick questions for Councillor Gohill? Thank you, Councillor Gohill. Thank you. Right. I'm, I wish I was that slide today. But anyway, <laughs> Councillor Bennett, you're first. Um, thank you, Chairman. Considering this application is up for refusal, I think it is shocking that the applicant, the agent, didn't choose to attend in person so that they could be asked questions. And I think that was arguably the worst written response I've heard read out. Aside from the, the praise of Owen to accuse the council's planning department of being prejudiced, discriminatory, making threats about legal action, it, if the role of these written statements is to try and get us as a committee to be in favour of an application, it certainly didn't do that whatsoever. Um, I, I just had a question about the number of HMOs in the area. Do we have that figure? So the um, the agent said that there were none. I just thought it would be good to verify that. Um, yeah, there doesn't appear to be any in the area, um, and the part of the policy allows up to 20%, but part four the policy also as a requirement that it uh, meets all other planning standards. Okay, go cool. come back, yeah. Thank you. Um, and then the other question was what kind of, considering he's, the, the agent is saying that there's going to be five people, no more, but we know based on the size that it can go up to ten, I'm guessing that just becomes an enforcement action if, if this were to be approved, there's, there's very limited sort of controls we can pl place to stop it happening yeah. and then if it does happen then it's an enforcement action. yeah we just couldn't we couldn't police it we couldn't police it you would that's the whole point you know you can't police it so you know one day there might be 10 people the next day they're up when you, the officer comes around there'll only be five so it's impossible um councillor davis uh thank you chairman um i've got a number of questions but first of all i just want to to comment on that statement that we've received from the applicant 
Um, Hilland and Council is not against HMOs, but it has to be the right HMOs. They have to be in the right area. And to come back with comments like that is absolutely appalling when you haven't even attended today. Um, now I'll go on to my questions. <laughs> <laughs> have, um, have we spoken with the LAS? Uh, not the LAS, uh, the London Fire Brigade on this, sorry. Have, did they have any comments on safety concerns? Are we in? Um, we, we, did, we didn't consult them on, on this one. It's a, a minor application. However, it would require to meet all building regs and HMO standards if we approved it. Okay. And uh, just for the record, can we confirm that we believe these rooms potentially could hold more than one person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just by the, the, the layout and the overall size of the bedrooms, um, they are slight. Well, they are a lot bigger than a standard double room. Yeah. Okay. Um, and my final question was: We've said that there was no HMOs within the area. Is that is that because some of the HMOs potentially could be below the the standard of five? Could be four? Could be three? And that's why? No, because in Article 4, any HMO, if, if correct me if I'm wrong, officers, any HMO has to have a licence and has to come to the planning commission yeah, when you have an Article 4. So my final question was going to be, how far up does, does that Article 4 area go? It's usually around universities and stuff like that, yeah. but I want it across the I'm whole of the borough. That if you want nimbyism, I'd like to have it across the borough. I'm anyway. believing that could be teetering on the edge. That's why I've asked in this question, because of the location. Well, we'll check that with you. We'll yep. Officer, check that up, and um, we'll come back to you. If that's Thank okay. you. That's all I have at the moment, Chairman. Thank you very Thank you. much. Councillor Gaelic. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just would like uh, to ask for some clarification. Um, if we condition, and we are prepared to it, um, accepted can we condition that there's a limit of people living there once hmo is licensed because obviously they will apply for license if it's licensed for five or six i don't think the enforcement officer can just go and inspect how many people are in occupation is that correct yeah you're absolutely right they have to write and i mean this is where the system breaks down a little bit they have to write to them saying that your officers are coming over to, to inspect the property and then they can change change things. The licence is there for a particular amount of people, but again, without having any monitoring, you can never tell how many people are there, so that's why we sort of like cater that. Councilman. Mann. Thank you, Chairman. I just want to thank the officers, first of all, for a thorough report and... Um, the arrogance of the, the statement that was read out and um, I think I echo the statements of, of everyone. Um, we're here to um, provide a service and, and that clearly isn't the kind of response that, that's going to help anybody. Um, just just coming on to the points in terms of um, enforcement, it's, it's very, very difficult, borderline impossible to enforce um, anybody in terms of occupants, so um, I do agree with the officer's recommendations. Yep. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Sorry, Chairman. I would like to second the proposal to go with the officer's recommendation. Thank you. So that's proposed and seconded. Also, I'm going to ask officers um, to ask the enforcement team to obviously have a look at the tree. I know it's a civil matter before legal jumps over me. Um, also, um, can we have a look at building their building management program? Obviously, they, they seem to be breaching that as well, so if, if uh, enforcement can have a look at that. we just come back to your answer. Don't worry. Go on, Councillor Council Davis. It was about the building management plan. That was all. Could so, sure I, we did I jump you? Yeah, Sorry. Thank you. I beg your pardon. Um, Ed, do you want to... Sorry, so could we just get some clarity over the building management plan? Query? Yeah, well, obviously, the, they were in breach of uh, their... They've got permission to do this extension, correct? But it seems to me they're, adhe they're not adhering to the rules that we lay out of when they can and when they can't build. And uh, it seems that residents are being disturbed. So while the enforcement team is looking at the tree, can they just make sure that they, they, they know what they're, when they're meant to be working when they're not? Is that OK? Yeah, thanks for the clarification. OK. So I'm proposing a seconded. Can I have a show of hands, those in favour, with the officer's recommendation? Thank you very much. So that is refused. 
Okay, uh, we go on to item 8, which is 39 Parkfield Road, Ickenham. And that is Owen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next item is item 8. Um, uh, the application seeks planning permission for the demolition of the existing bungalow and erection of a two-storey replacement dwelling with associated parking. Um, since the publication of the agenda, there has been a few additional objections received, um, which have been included in the addendum. Uh, the objections received do not raise any new issues from the printed report. Um, the The application site is situated on the south western side of Parkfield Road and comprises uh, existing uh, part two story single story dwelling. To the north lies 41 Parkfield, a bungalow set slightly behind the existing building line of the application site. Uh, it contains a single story rear extension. And to the south lies 37 uh, Par Parfield Road, which is a detached bungalow. The existing application site contains, uh, as I said, part two story and is characterised by a hipped roof, um, a cream render, and external finish. So, this is the constraints uh, plan. Um, there's no, uh, it's not within a conservation area or um, look, uh, listed building. Uh, there is a, a, a TPO to the rear of the site, um, which comprises a large oak category A tree, uh, and directly to the rear with, uh, within a rectory way is a parking management scheme in place. We have um, the bird's eye aerial view. Um, <coughs> you can see the large oak tree in the rear garden. Um, then you see it in the wider context. Uh, it's noticeable from the aerial that there are a mixture of housing types on along the street. So. Next slide is the existing plans. Um, at ground floor, uh, you have um, largely uh, kitchen dining at the back, living accommodation and garage to the front. At first floor, you have uh, three bedrooms with uh, two uh, main windows facing number 41. And the uh, proposed uh, plans, uh, which uh, with the two-storey element of the building set in 1.5 metres from the side boundary with 41 and uh, it, 3 metres from the side boundary with number 37. The ground floor plan is made up of living quarters uh, plus a guest room and a first floor you have four bedrooms uh, with uh, ensuite facilities. And then you have the roof plan, which shows addif additional uh, ancillary accommodation and uh, uh, the roof plan showing uh, six roof lights. So this is the proposed uh, elevations. Um, again, you, you see uh, the crown roof. Um, you also have a projecting gable at the front which is approximately uh, 0.8 metres further forward the, the main facade. Um, and then you see a single storey element to the rear, part single storey to the side with number 37 um, and the two storey element which uh, is set in from that boundary. This is the proposed block plan. Um, again, you see um, the actual uh, the building line is uh, aligning with number 37 on the left-hand side. 
Um, you see number 41 slightly set back, the building line there. And you also, if you want to note, uh, the 45 degree test is shown on both the rear and uh, front of the plans of both neighbouring properties. And again, this is a street scene photo of um, of the current situation on on the top. In terms of you have the existing uh, dwelling, uh, the second one in from the from the left, uh, which is two story, part two story. Um, if you see further to the right, there's also a a two-storey um, dwelling at number 43, I believe. Sorry, I'll just go back. And, and, and on the, the ground floor, or the underneath plan, there is also uh, the, um, the proposed dwelling, which, uh, as you see, is kind of similar roof line to number 43. So... This is the existing front elevation on the left hand side and on the right you have uh, the rear elevation of the property. And just in, in terms of references, there, there are quite a few uh, buildings in recent times that have be, been granted along the street. Um, number 29 Parkfield is uh, shown on the photo on the left. Now the plan, uh, that accompanies, there was actually a further application in 2021 that had a approval for uh, revised plans, um, and if you need reference, I can provide that for you. So that that plan that's on the right is slightly inaccurate. So this is another example at number 54 and 54A Parkfield. Um, Initial permission was allowed at appeal in 2016, and that's number 55 Parkfield Road. Um, again, uh, another uh, replacement dwelling. In terms of, I just included the tree protection plan just to show um, the actual oak tree would be protected at the back of the site, and we have. Uh, suitable conditions added to uh, the report to ensure that this is uh, complied with. In, in, in terms of the assessment, the principle of a replacement dwelling is acceptable. Uh, there, there are no policy restrictions restricting the demolition of a house um, in this area, and similar works have been uh, approved on the street. It would replace a family size unit with a larger family size unit with no loss of housing. In terms of design and low impact on local character, a key material consideration was the recent appeal decision in 2021 in 29 Parkway, November 21. This appeal involved replacement of a two and a half story uh, of similar size and bulk with similar features. Um, within the appeal decision, the, the planning inspectress did mention that the replacement dwelling was an alt altogether larger proposition than the existing bungalow and would mark it out as different in scale. However, its characteristics reflected other consistent features along Parkfield, maintaining building lines and maintaining gaps between the frontages on either side of the road. The inspectorate, inspectorate recognised the substantial overall height and transition from the height of the number 31. However, they concluded that this height transformation was not unduly harsh, despite their very different scale. The inspectorate also note, noted that the dwelling would not be disruptive to the pattern of development along Parkfield Road. On this basis, the appeal was allowed. Um, in terms of the application site, the overall height of the roof would be similar in scale to the height of the appeal site. Um, given the comments within 
the appeal uh, verdict it would be difficult to, to support a design refusal in this instance from for the current application first of all i suppose another point would be that the existing dwelling is part two story already and the height increase would be similar in, in in height with what was approved at number 21 29 the overall scale of the dwelling is very similar to the appeal size um as shown on the photos there are existing properties on parfield with similar scale two-story building and on balance it would not be harmful to the overall character <coughs> the building lines have also been altered uh, amended to reflect the building line at number 37 parkfield and the two-story element is set in from both sides of the pl plots um, similar to number 29 in terms of architecture, the two-storey front gable features are not uncommon feature on the more recently constructed replacement dwellings, and the materials are acceptable for with future details secured by condition. On balance, uh, it was considered the design was acceptable. In terms of neighbours' amenity, officers are satisfied development would not cause sufficient harm to either neighbour and pr property to warrant a refusal. As is shown on the plans, the two-storey replacement dwelling would align with the building line at number 37. The um, two-storey rear element is set in from the boundary with number 37 and would not breach the 45 degree line to the rear. To the front, the block plan also demonstrates that the proposal would not breach 45 degree line from the front windows. The neighbouring property at number 41 is set further into the rear garden and extends beyond the building line of the proposed replacement dwelling. In terms of Additional um, information, the, uh, a daylight sunlight report uh, was submitted which examined habitable rooms uh, on both flanks of either neighbouring property. The daylight report confirmed full compliance with the uh, Bree daylight sunlight guidance um, and as such officers are satisfied that there would be, uh, it would not cause significant harm to those windows. To the rear, there would be a separation distance um, with the neighbours along Rectory Way of over 30 metres, and on the opposite side of the road, it's over 20, 23 metres. In terms of parking, uh, it would continue to provide sufficient parking to the dwelling, and the highways have raised no objection. Um, the overall standard of accommodation would be sufficient to ensure outlook private amenities space is protected and as stated previously um, we have conditions attached to ensure the, the safety of, of the TPO at the rear. Overall officers are satisfied that the development would not cause harm to local character neighbours amenity and provide the suitable living standards for future occupants. It, is therefore recommended for permission subject to conditions. Uh, thank you, Owen. Okay, um, just a quick question before we I get the petitioners in. Um, HMO on this still has to come back to the council for a license, correct? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. In, okay. in terms of H HMO, if if it was to a larger HMO, it would have to. If it was to convert into a HMO. Yeah. yeah. Six or more people yeah, would. Okay, yeah. fine. Okay, um, we have an unusual situation, and uh, obviously, as a chairman, I have some discretions to, to allow certain things. So, uh, on this item, uh, both petitioners will be permitted to speak for up to five minutes uh, each, as some of so it was a late notification on one of the petitioners regarding the meeting. However, usually, I exercise my discretion where there are multiple petitions on the same application and reserve the rights to reduce their speaking times. Obviously, one is a written response, so uh, that's okay. So, Richard Kurt is here. If you'd like to come forward, Richard Kurt. 
or shall I say, come on down. Uh, no, uh, if you can give it to the officer, please. To officer. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. This writes to the slides. When okay, I'll give that oh, to you. We'll give that right to over to the... Yeah, we'll yeah, pass the signing officer That's so okay. we can flick through. Yeah, thank you. It relates to slides, Katie. So we can flick through if that's okay. Can I also give you some photographs to be taken? Uh, no, no, that's no. fine, because most of us have... We have application. We have the application and photos, so it's okay. not a problem. That's okay. That's fine. Okay, so you have five minutes. Uh, you'll be four green, one amber, and red. I do stop you. I'm not being rude. That's just what the way it is. Okay, whenever you're ready, as soon as you press the button. My name's Richard Kirk. I live at 36 Parkfield Road. For those not familiar with Parkfield Road, number 39 is situated between four bungalows. 35, 37, 41A and 41, with five bungalows also on the opposite side of the road. I will focus on planning application itself for the development of number 39 and why it should be refused on the basis of which it's been presented to the planning department and now the council today. Simply put, the documents and plans submitted are at best inaccurate and at worst a deliberate lie to deceive the council. Having bought the property over a year ago, the new owners have not lived at the address. Instead, strangers move in and out of the property at random. Whilst the report states this is not to be an HMO, a boarding house, guest house, hotel or flats, essentially it's already one. Final, the final drawings illustrate a minimum of six self-contained double-bedded bedrooms, five of which are in suite, with potential for two more the family home has a large laundry room, two kitchens. This is simply not a family home. There is also a question of why someone would purchase a house for £1.25 million, plan to spend an additional £2 million on a family home in Parkfield Road. It is obviously a commercial investment, it fails to blend with the street scene and is to the detriment of all the neighbours and the values we cherish. Furthermore, it is obvious that the off-street parking is not adequate and the additional cars will spill onto the road in our quiet cul-de-sac, which has limited parking already. To quickly go through the planning officer's comments, a great emphasis has been placed on the proposed building complies with the BRE guidelines. For this section, I comment on the exterior as drawn in the plans. The consultant has selectively chosen sections which benefit the applicant. The BRE should be taken in its full text and particular attention should be paid to the relevant sections that are currently ignored. L limited light available means it is more precious and must be conserved. Elderly require more light. On all sides of this development, the neighbours are retirees or pensioners. Passive solar effect, where the house is warm directly from the sun, instead now becomes cold and damp. This full context implies that all windows of number 41 facing number 39 should be included in the calculations not just a select few. Additionally, I strongly dispute the validity and accuracy figures in the Staylight report, vastly overestimate the light remaining after the construction. 48A currently enjoys passive solar warmth and a vertical sky component of 23 degrees. This will be reduced to only 2 degrees, a reduction of 93%. The errors are that, in his report, the consultant refers to the drawings provided for his calculations. These scale drawings are inaccurate. In reality, the proposed building is three metres from number 41, but in the drawing it is further, further shown away. The vertical sky component does not take into account the eaves of the bungalow, themselves a common characteristic of the street. At the very least, the council must independently verify the sky calculations taking into account all the loss of light on all windows and rooms, as the PRE, P, B, BRE suggests in this context, not the minimum guidelines. Moving into the drawings themselves, it is physically impossible to construct the building as planned. To accommodate the necessary changes required to make the habitable rooms livable, there have to be unapproved changes to increase the roof space pitch and ridge length, a huge increase in volume. This is because the height of the doors will hit the planned opening Velox windows in the roof. 
Therefore, either the windows will have to be lowered or the roof ridge extended beyond what is planned, just like number 29, a boxy, incongruous appearance which will also affect the BRE calculations. There is also hidden heights that must be added to the drawing that are not considered. considered. The depth of the ground floor itself and all the floor joists and roof insulation dimensions are unspecified. When added, these will result to an increase in height above that which is stated. On the topic of mistakes, the same window is drawn either on the first floor or ground floor in different diagrams, and the existing property diagrams feature numerous mistakes. It shows a lack of care and attention to deal, which will ultimately lead to something having to be built that is different from that presented today. This is the most glaring error in the street scene, diagram 39 PR 300, where number 43 is not drawn to scale and misrepresents the street scene. As summarised, for the reasons presented on the screen, the Council must refuse this application or at least delay the decision. At the very least, the decision must be deferred so that the planning officers can do a site visit themselves, calculate everything from scratch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. OK, does anybody have any questions? Councillor Davis and then Councillor Bennett. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that section there? Not really. I was, I was just out of, out of, out of uh, a finishing paragraph. And, and is there anything... Councilor. Sorry, with the... So, with your officer... Um, let me start that again. Question, please. I'm asking my question. Sorry, I've got tongue-tied. So I do apologise, Chairman. Um, have, have you had an open dialogue with the people that are doing the development? Have they been open with you? Has anything been mentioned along the lines of HMO or...? I'll repeat what, uh, what I said earlier. Having bought the property over a year ago, the new owners have not lived at the address measuring up the plot. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bennett. Um, thank you, Chairman. Mine wasn't a question, but just to say thank you uh, after the last agenda item where we have probably uh, the worst written representation we've seen. I think this is probably one of the best from a petitioner, so just thank you for very clearly uh, being quite factual and providing images and, and diagrams as well. Okay. It's very helpful. I'm, I'm pleased that uh, you said that because uh, obviously we've been practising and trying, <laughs> trying, and trying not to, to gabble. You know, it's, it's very difficult. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate Thank that. you very much. Anybody else? Anything? No? Thank you very much. You may take your seat. Thank you very much. Switch the microphone off me, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Liz, do you want to... Thank you, Chair. Yes, so we had another petitioner on this item um, who has submitted a written submission. Um, as outlined in the planning document compiled by the officer, number 39's design is modelled on number 29's. I will circle back, circle back to this comparison specifically, but it's important to contextualise the emerging street scene that is referred to and attempts to justify these developments. It tells a story of how small, sympathetic developments led to a beginning of an erosion of the street scene. The most recent developments now apply for planning permission and then simply ignore all the conditions and plans and future developers use these to springboard and build even more dominant houses. The emerging street scene of other houses referenced by the report, which is the result of progressively taking advantage of the current residents' affable and non combative nature and the council's stretched resources, is wholly unwelcome. Parkfield Road was, and still is, a vast majority bungalow street, with the four original two-storey buildings being set in far larger plots so that their bungalow neighbours could continually enjoy natural sunlight. The residents of Parkfield Road and the road behind, Directory Way, bought and paid a premium for their properties because the bungalows afford privacy from being overlooked, are light, warm and airy with many windows on all four walls to take advantage of and enjoy the sun at all times. The street scene is far more than aesthetics. It regulates the size and mass of proposed and built properties. The first developments to disrupt the street scene were 31A and 31B, built over a single bungalow plot, after which a visiting councillor remarked that they had been misled by the application and that the development should never have been approved, quoted from document 40891-APP-2009-280. Number 43 was then given permission to extend. The most recent owners then applied for planning permission to change the roof pitch, height and inclusion of rear dormer windows. These were all refused, but they put up scaffolding, and when the new roof was revealed, it had a dormer, was higher, cast more shadow, and overlooks the neighbours. 
This property is used in the street scene diagram in today's application for number 39 as built. It's a springboard that shouldn't exist and itself due for planning enforcement investigation. Which brings us to number 29. I understand the reticence of the council to refuse something so apparently similar to 29, which was passed on appeal. However, there are two very important considerations. Firstly, that the plans submitted to the planning inspector were confusing. In his report, he even stated that he was confused and did not know which drawings to look at. The most relevantly misleading draw was, drawing was that of the street scene, which showed 29 being built at the same height as 31A, as 31A, sorry. 31A is 6.95 metres and 29 is 8 metres in the plan, an obvious misrepresentation. Even with this height, the planning inspector stated that the roof space was to be uninhabitable, as they stipulated that no windows were to be installed. There were no windows in the plan, and that no windows could ever be added for the lifetime of the building. However, when the scaffolding was removed, it became obvious that the roof is another bedroom with many windows facing every direction and a dormer. To accommodate this, the bays at the front are widened, the roof height raised and the front bays hipped roof exchanged for intimidating gable ends. The result is a demonstrative, demo, demonstrably large, massive, intimidating building which overlooks neighbours and imposes its presence along the sight line. Secondly, it is from this illegitimate building that number 39 is modelled with a habitable roof space that was expressly forget, forbidden by the inspector. As number 29 is due to be under investigation by the planning enforcement team, it is wholly unsuitable to use for a comparison to justify another development. Why is there comparison drawing approved 29 and 39 in the submitted plans? Because they look so different. If 29 was sent to the planning inspector as built, it would not meet his conditions and would have been refused. To reiterate, 39 is not modelled on what 29 should have been, but what it illegally is. On the merit of 39 alone, because it mirrors all the negative qualities of the unpermitted developments, the application should be refused. At least, however, the consideration of these proposed plans by the Council must be delayed whilst enforcement is investigated and performed, as the context of the street scene is misrepresented to the planning officers and members of the planning committee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Um is the applicant agent here, Mr. Chair or Mr. Austin? No. Okay. Uh, Councillor Goddard, if you'd like to take your seat. You're a very experienced person as you are. You know you only have three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Members of the committee, Mr Kirk, the petitioner, has raised some material doubts about this planning application, uh, and it seems to me that it clearly uh, puts the committee in a position where it possibly cannot uh, reach a favourable decision in support of the uh, officer's recommendation at this time. Firstly, there's the question of the accuracy, reliability and achievability of the plans which have been submitted by the applicant. Secondly, there is a material uncertainty flowing from this as to the reliability of the daylight and sunlight assessment. Thirdly, and perhaps most significantly, there is the hitherto unresolved question as to whether or not the finally approved plans for number 29 Parkfield Road were properly adhered to throughout the construction process. The petitioners have provided examples of how they believe that the approved plans were not complied with, and this I would put to you, requires investigation. You will be aware that the application for number 29 was originally refused by Hillingdon, but that this decision was reversed by the Secretary of State on appeal, and that this has therefore become highly significant in the benchmark, as a benchmark for this and indeed future planning applications in Parkfield Road. It would be far too easy for the physical form of number 29 to become the standard, whilst this may not comply with the plans which were accepted at appeal. There also seems to be some inconsistency in the understanding as to the purpose of this development. Is it a hostel, an Airbnb or an HMO? The planning officers assert that it is none of these things, while Mr Kirk's reasonable observations would appear to provide contradictory evidence. It is therefore clear to me that if this application is not refused this evening, this item should at least be adjourned so that officers and members can conduct a site visit and that all material aspects of planning inconsistencies identified by the petitioners can be checked and addressed. 
In any event, even if this application were to succeed, I suggest in the strongest possible terms that the following conditions should be imposed. Firstly, that the redeveloped site may not be used as a hostel, Airbnb or HMO. Secondly, that no further permitted development rights be granted. And thirdly, that precise construction hours be conditioned and that these be dealt with as an absolute condition rather than as informatives, as sometimes happens. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Um, does anybody have any questions? Councillor Goddard? Thank you, Councillor Goddard. Um, this is a difficult one. Um, I'm going to ask a question of officers before I open it to the floor. Uh, daylight sunlight review. Ed, can you have you are you happy with that, or can we actually third, get a third party if we feel like like it? So officers have reviewed the daylight and sunlight reports, and officers were content with the details. However, mm. if members want an independent third party specialist to review that document, then we could defer the application and arrange that at the applicant's cost. Okay, fine. So, who's that? Turn your phone off, please. Uh, so uh, that's just a bit of information from, from members. Councillor Davis and Councillor Bennett. Um, so I'm glad you've asked about the daylight and sunlight um, assessment. Can I just ask how that works? Is that done just from plans that have been submitted, or have we actually been out and verified that the plan, the figures are accurate? I'm, I'm not au fait with the daylight sunlight assessment, how it works. So if I could get some clarity on that. Um, yeah, it would be for a pro professional expert uh, that would carry out the uh, assessment on daylight sunlight. Um, as officers, we, we, we wouldn't uh, go out and on site to verify it, but uh, if it complies with the uh, BRI guidelines, uh, which on, on review of it, it does, um, we generally would uh, find it acceptable. If I can come back on that, Chairman. Yes. So what I'm trying to get at is if we say that there's a distance between a building of three metres, do we take the report at its word or do we check that there's a distance from building A to building B as three metres? In, in terms of officers' uh, assessment, we, we would survey the site in question in terms of our site inspection. Um, so uh, an officer would have gone out to the site to... Uh, uh, see the actual layout of existing buildings. Um, now, obviously, if there was uh, descriptions in the daylight sunlight report that didn't reflect what was on site, we could raise that with okay. the applicant. Okay. Um, and also, actually, I'll leave it there for the time being, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Bennett. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm going to quote you. There was an application that we considered some time ago about a hotel in right. Hayes, and I think you said if it if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Um, and I think, Mr. Kerr, I was reading his slides this afternoon. I think he has raised, as Councillor Goddard said, material doubts on this. And I just wanted to ask officers about the the dimensions. So we've done the, the kind of daylight sunlight. There was some um, concern expressed around the dimensions in terms of the height, the massing on the street scene, the doors where the windows were. Um, just whether we've had a chance to kind of digest the petitioner's concerns and overlay that over the report. Casey, do you want to take that away? It's very nice to get quoted back in my saying. That's, that's quite good. But, uh, I, must be, I must be doing my job right. Anyway, Casey. Uh, well, yeah, we have reviewed the comments. In terms of the roof lights, it's on the, on the elevations and the floor plans. It looks accurate, but the one that the... Um, potentially one of the plans, it may be slightly off. It's hard to tell because you're obviously not looking at a 2D. Um, it's not depicted. Yes. It's depicted on an angle on <laughs> the roof slope. Um, so in terms of the proposed roof lights, um, what we could do, because we have a condition in there anyway on the uh, for side elevation windows being obscure glazed and fixed shut above um, the 1.8 metres, we could apply that to the side roof lights as well, but also um, seek further details as a condition, just to where this, just to ensure that the sighting of the roof light on the side elevations are consistent across all the drawings. Um, what was oh, in terms of the doors, um, we did measure that as well. So doors on average are about two metres in height. It does appear to us that it can fit within the house, but notwithstanding, if they did need to come back to 
change the, the external dimensions and heights of the dwelling, it would require planning permission. So it would um, be something that we would need to assess at that point. But conversely, it, because it's not a whole new, it's not a new dwelling in the roof. There's no requirement for it to be 2.5 metres floor, you know, floor to ceiling um, finished height. So that it is uh, supplementary bedrooms and um, storage space and things like that. So it can be slightly smaller to fit within the um, depicted heights shown on the plan. So um, the proposed street scene elevation, that would also form uh, one of the approved drawings. So if it did turn out that it ends up being significantly larger than every other dwelling depicted on that street scene elevation, it wouldn't be consistent with the approved drawings. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Councillor Tubinor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could we add a condition to, for, for this side not to be used as an as an HMO? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we can, but um, I'll ask officers, HMO or hotel or Airbnb? Yeah. Do you, do you want to put that up, Katie? In terms of an, the uh, uses in HMO, so the reason officers haven't included it is because how we're looking at is, is it are the impacts any different to a larger family that's occupying the house that may have you know adult children living there as well? So we're looking at things like does it have an impact on parking? Uh, does it have an impact on the amenity of the surrounding area? So we've taken the position that it would be no different to being occupied by a larger family than it would of being occupied by um, non-related occupants within the dwelling. Um, but that said, members are always um, free to uh, make their own decisions. Um, we would just need, uh, ju I guess, justification of what the impacts of concern are for us to include a condition. Okay, Councillor Davis again and then Councillor Bennett again. Um, I just want to pick up on a point that was raised. Is there, a, is there currently any enforcement action being taken out on this property? <laughs> Katie was just looking it up actually. Yes, yeah, so this was something I wanted to clarify as well because it came up in both um, both petitioners' speeches. Um, so there was an investigation commenced. It was it was finished in January essentially. Um, the development is number 29 is in accordance with the approved plan. So there was a most recent planning permission um, in 2022. The last numbers are 1565. So that was the one that included the roof lights and the dormers as well. So it has been investigated and um, no further action has been taken from enforcement. So it was found to be within plans, yeah? Yes. Uh, and they were very minor elements that had to be changed, so I'll emphasise that. Councillor Bennett. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I, d I did have a question about the garage. Uh, I've got a second one as well. But uh, Yeah, oh, sorry. If we could go back to the slide that showed the garage. I mean, I'd like to. I like to think I'm a good parker, but there's. I mean, there's not much room there. I mean, is this a a Corsa or an Astra size? That's, that's Mercedes. Yeah, I mean, that's a Mercedes. It's not uh, either of those. <laughs> it is Ikenham after all. Um, no, seriously. I mean, how is is this a garage that we think is of reasonable sized use for a car? Um, bec because that on the diagram it is bumper to bumper. Who's going to take that? Alan, is that yours or is it...? Uh Thank you, Chairman. Um, the garage yes, is five metres in length and, uh, as a reference, the uh, car parking space in a supermarket is 4.8 metres. That answers your question. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, and the, the second um, question that I was going to... Um, the challenge with this application is if, is if we reject it, it could be subsequently approved at appeal. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's rare that, that we, we do this, but I don't. I think given the very valid um, comments from the petitioner, I, I don't feel comfortable that we have everything we have need today okay. to approve. So I, I would like to propose a deferment and a site visit. Yeah. I think given the <coughs> um, the speculation around the dimensions in particular and the proximity to other properties and sunlight and daylight. I feel I would get value from seeing that firsthand. I think it would also give officers time to just review each of Mr. Kirk's points and maybe build that into a, an updated okay. report just so that we, we we can be very comfortable that 
what we are approving is, is what is written in front of us. So you're proposing, please? Yes, so proposing a deferment. Uh, a site visit? Site visit. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Davis. Davis. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I would second the site visit on this one, but also um, I would feel comfortable to have the daylight and sunlight assessment reviewed by a third party. Um, just because, and I also believe that we should add the condition for no HMO. Um, and my justification is they've told us that it's going to be a family dwelling. It should be no problem to the, the people that are going to live in this to have that condition. Or at least have it conditioned that if we want to make it a HMO, they have to bring it back to this committee. That is the, the rules, but w but we can address that when it comes back to committee. Yes, so, are the, uh, so are you seconding? I'm uh, seconding. Your council. So I have a proposal and second uh, on the floor for a site visit and to ask for a further daylight and sunlight review, correct? Yeah. Councillor Mand. Just on the site visit to keep it relevant, um, I am struggling to understand the benefit and relevance of a site visit from councillors um, when we've already been told that the officers have visited the site. I'm not sure what kind of experts we are on sunlight and how we are going to address that and in terms of if something we believe might be bulky or above dimensions it's not built yet and the other thing is how are we going to assess in regards to HMO if the, if the family is living there or not and that as we know is subject to a, a, a separate application so yeah. that that is probably got nothing to do with what is currently being proposed so I'm finding it a, li a little confusing in terms okay. of what the councillors would, would gain out of the site. I, I, I will agree with you with the second point. That is not in our remit. You know, if someone has a HMO or an Airbnb, that's a separate issue that would have to come back first to be before we go through enforcement. Then if they wanted a licence, then it would have to come back to committee. So I agree with you there. But as members, it is your right if you don't feel comfortable with what's before you and you would like to go on site, that has to be proposed in seconds, which it is done. And it, it's there up to them then, as you as committee, not me, up to you as a committee to decide whether you want to do that. And that's just a show of hands like we do everything else. So I get the second point. The first point, it's one, it is your right. You know, that, that must remember, you know, you're not sitting here just because we need to get this thing, you, you have some jurisdiction and responsibilities and those are your rights, so that's up to you. Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you, Officer, and, and we, they explained everything uh, regarding the HMO, the sunlight, or everything, the height, and uh, Mr. Mand, he said, if we are satisfied here, we no need to side with I think this is like quite complicated. I think if we do the site visit, we can see the clear picture because we are looking at the both sides, the applicant and the resident. So I agree with that. Yeah. Well, you've been doing this as long as me, so you know that. So. Yeah, so I've had a proposal. Yes, Councillor Bennett. Yeah, so just just one final point, I guess, why, why I was suggesting a site visit is when you, when you review all of these applications, sometimes there's one that just stands out as this doesn't fully add up. And we have the petitioner's points there, but it, the, the purchase price of the home, the fat it's sacked empty, the cost further involved, I don't know, that coupled with everything else. Be kept, no, sorry, sorry is, Jimmy, don't, don't, I'm getting you upsetting my legal people today, I'll tell you. But it's Calm a, down. That is not a planning concern. In light of okay, Councillor well, Lane's comments. Yeah, that's fine. I, I appreciate it. You don't have to justify yourself anyway, so that's fine. But values and how much cost things cost, not for here. That's for somewhere else and uh, probably nowhere in the council. Don't think. Unless, unless we're going to change their ban so they have to pay more money for council tax. Well, that's a different matter. So I'm proposed and seconded for a, a site visit. And I think the main thing here is that what we're really asking for is that daylight and sunlight. Yeah, and I don't think it would do us any harm having a site visit as well. Um, so I'm proposing to take this kind of show of hands those in favour of site visit. So that is bar one, unanimous. And uh, so that be, that's deferred now, and then we will take it up. If you wish to have another petition, you have to get your signatures again, and if you wish to speak when it comes back to committee. I'm just warning uh, residents out there. Okay? So 
that's we're leaving that. So we are now moving on to nine Dyson Drive. I think Councillor Bennett, you'd like to leave. He, he abstained. Okay. He was a, sorry, Councillor. He was abstention, abstention, or or a, or a no, no abstention. Okay. Right. We've all moved around. Right. Uh, sorry, can you take your conversations outside? Sorry, we have a committee to them. Thank you. Right. Ed, over to you. Thank you, Chair. So, item nine on, the, uh, 9 on the agenda is an application for alterations to the parking layout on Dyson Drive to provide eight formalised car parking spaces. The application has come before committee due to the submission of a petition in support of the proposal when the application is recommended for refusal. So, I'll take members through the plans. This is the, uh, the site location plan. Uh, essentially, this is, the, um, is Dyson Drive. That's what the, the site covers. So the constraints plan, you can just about see um, a tiny air of green belt just in the in the top of that constraints plan, but uh, otherwise no other constraints really close to the site. So this is the uh, existing location <coughs> and site plan. Uh, you can see some perpendicular parking that goes off Dyson Drive. And this is the proposed parking layout. So it's um, we believe there's informal parking that goes on at the moment, and this is to formalise that parking. This is the, uh, the way the parking is allocated at the moment, and this is a bird's eye view of the site. And here are some site photographs, so you can see that um, informal parking at the moment, and critically you can see that it's a shared surface, so this isn't an adopted road, this is a private road. There's no footway, that's an important point to note. Some more photographs. Okay, so Dyson Drive is located within Phase 3B of St Andrews Park Development. This phase of the development has 71 formal car parking spaces as per the planning consent for the phase, which was consented in 2016. Since then, members be, will be aware that the policy landscape has altered with regards to parking and the consented level now exceeds the maximum of 46.5 spaces permissible by the London Plan's maximum residential parking standards. Therefore, the provision of an additional eight car parking spaces would exacerbate the existing over-provision of car parking when considered against current policy. This has raised an objection from the Council's Highways Department, who recommend refusal of the application. In addition, the over-provision of car parking is contrary to the broader policy position which rega with regards to climate change, which seeks to encourage sustainable development, including a move towards more sustainable forms of transport. In addition to the development being contrary to parking policies, there are additional and significant concerns with regards to highway safety, and I'll pass on to Alan, who will explain those concerns. Thank you, Chairman. Um, policy T7 of the London Plan states that development proposals must not increase road danger. Um, just going back to that uh, photograph, you can see there that uh, there is no footway provided. All of the carriageway is what's known as shared space, where pedestrians, cyclists, car drivers all mix. Next slide. Thank you. Um, the perpendicular car, sorry, the parallel car parking would occupy a space of 2.4 metres. Next slide. Leaving three metres wide for the passage of vehicles, which would only allow one way working. Thank you. That's the swept track path drawings that have been provided. It's not very clear, apologies for that, but the very top drawing shows a, a refuse vehicle passing. And as you can see there, it occupies the full width of the carriageway. Next slide. And this is a page taken from Manual for Streets, which shows the amount of space, the width that's taken by various uh, road users. They're called pedestrians road users. 
as you can see there, a parent or guardian pushing a buggy accompanied with somebody else occup occupies a space of 1.5 metres. So quite simply, uh, with the parallel parking, there's not enough room left for vehicles and pedestrians, cyclists to mix. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. So the spaces are currently used for informal parking. And as stated before, Dyson Drive is a private road, which means that it is unadopted by the council and therefore enforcement of parking restrictions on the site will be down to a private enforcement company. Twelve letters of support have been received along with two letters of objection. In addition, as stated previously, a petition in support has been received with 49 signatures. There are no addendum matters. So whilst we understand the, um, the application, applicant's desire for the additional parking, um, in, in conclusion, the proposals are, are contrary to current parking policies and critically, they raise highway safety concerns. As such, the application is recommended for refusal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, before I go any further, can I just ask a question from legal? Um, liability. So we've got this coming before us, okay? We know that if that type of parking is endangering people, where do, does that leave us anywhere, or is it not because it's a private road, it's not a council responsibility? Or am I just talking loads of nonsense? <laughs> um, yeah, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be li liable in, in in any way. We Great. yeah, we've yeah, Great. it's just that's not so a, a consideration. We're you're making your statutory decisions in relation to matters. Okay, fine. Uh, petitioner. Uh, is it Prajapati? No, That's fine. Come, come down. What's your name? Sir? You Mr. Conway. Yeah, come down. Come on down. You've got five minutes. You share it as much as you want. He's even got you a chair. I think it's easy. Yeah. So you're the actual agent, not the petitioner. Yeah. On this one, it's different because the, the applicants are the nine horse holders. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's fine. So, as you've got five minutes, you want to share it between you? <coughs> Knock yourselves out. Uh, the, the, as soon as you press the red button, it will we'll start. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Chair. Um, thank you, committee members, as well. Um, yeah, obviously, we've read the, the officer's report. We understand where, where they're coming from in terms of current adopted planning policy. Um, however, I think in this particular case, we feel that a kind of common sense approach is probably what is needed. Um, so you've heard that it's a private road. The parking spaces are already there, so they're already used by residents. It's a cul-de-sac as well, so there's no through traffic. Um, I did send over some photographs, mm. and I don't know if I'm... Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so the if you five, yeah, showing the driving school guy. Yeah. If you want to click it. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, what's it quite? I think what what's interesting about this mm. application, it's quite unusual in my from my perspective. I think that I'm here representing virtually all the residents of this street, this private street, and they've put this application in in order to obviously regulate the parking and actually manage it better than it currently is. So we we have had a transport specialist, you know, prepare a transport statement in support of this application. They, they've looked at the highway safety matters, which has been raised by Dr. Alan Tilly. But, or I think the the view we're taking on it is that these spaces are already provided on the street, but they're unregulated. And um, by providing formal spaces that are allocated, they can be managed better. So therefore, highway safety is improved. Uh, so um, I would just like to pass over, I think, because um, yeah. as a resident, I think we need to get a personal touch on this. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, uh, committee. Um, who, who we are? We're a group of eight house owners in the Dyson Drive. Between us, we have seven of the eight houses containing 14 children under the age of nine, 10 under five. Four of those are between newborn and 18 months. We moved here. It's nice and safe, quiet road, dead end. Um, we, we live in a three bedroom house and we have one allocated parking space. There's been a mistake by the developer 
originally, uh, and across your state, every single house, two beds and above, has two allocated parking spaces. We wrote a lot of emails, dug our feet in, and so the developers made the land available to correct their original error. Um, the, the parking, as you see, is there. All we're asking for is white lines on the road. The, the, you know, the, your highways guys report is, you know, it's not, it's not the same as our highways guys report. It's fine. There was no problems. The, you know, the refuse trucks go there and back. The cars that are parking there now, they leave it there for months. The, the people are visiting Uxbridge Town Centre, they're going to the shops, you know. You've got, you see how close you are to the road, you've got people starting, you know, parking their trucks overnight, not trucks, but, you know, big vans. All the will in the world, you can't start those quietly at 6.30 in the morning, you know. It, it's very disruptive, and with the kids and that, it's just extra journeys, all these strangers coming up and down the road. And just to put paint on the road, that's it. We're not increasing, you know, I, I really appreciate all the technical, of it, but we're not increasing the number of car journeys. We're decreasing the number of car journeys. We're making it safer for ourselves. Just paint on the road. That's it. Nothing's going to change apart from that. It's the status quo. It's, you know, it'll be fine. It's really, I, 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 for the life of me, it's like paint on the road. That's it. Yeah. That, that, that it's is common sense. That's that all is. I'm asking for. You know, it's yeah. like. So the uses yeah. at the yeah. moment is yeah. already established. Yeah. They, they are used for parking. So the reason for refusal, I think, says that the proposal would result in over-provision of car parking, but actually we're not proposing additional car parking, mm. we're just regulating and managing the existing parking better. Yeah. So I think if you come at it from that perspective, I appreciate policy says we should be yeah. reducing car parking, but in this particular circumstance, uh, the residents are supportive of it. Um, we're not increasing parking. No. <laughs> so um, I, I would really just implore members to. We're just, you know, we're, we're taxpayers. We're just trying to, you know, enjoy our lives, and uh, that's that's really. It. I hope you can see my point of view. That's it. They've got like two each, but they've chopped loads of the green out. For us, we've got more green. So, you know, it's a happy circumstance. Everyone's going to be happy. You're happy, we're happy. We've got more green, a bit of paint on the road, you know. Yeah. That's yeah, it. Yeah, I have to stop there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Has anybody got any questions for the applicants? No? No? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay. Right. I think we have to get some, before we go there, I think, or before I open it before, we just have to get some clarity here, okay? Private road, nothing to do with us, okay? That's the first thing we've got to say, okay? So the only reason it's come to committee is because there's a petition, okay? That's right so far, all right? Right. So do you guys want to expand on... I understand where where the petitioners are coming from the solution was what you don't want to happen is to use the green space because I think that would eliminate things I'm not a big fan of the London plan anyway you know that guys so I'm not going to try and justify that we're Hillingdon people would have more cars we usually have two cars in a household um, but I just want some clarity about the the road and our responsibilities that we have on that site so uh the informal parking that occurs at the moment, uh, that's not consented parking. So that's over and above the parking that was consented. The idea of a, a shared access route is that because it's shared, vehicles travel more slowly because there's uncertainty about pedestrians, cyclists. So that's why it's the, the width that it is. Now, as you've stated, it's a, it's a private road. The council has no enforcement action or no enforcement powers. So there is no controls at the moment. There's no private company that appears to be controlling the parking, but that's not consented parking. So by formalising it, we would be consenting the additional parking, which is going above and beyond the policy position of what parking levels are allowed by policy. Yeah. So in layman's English, that means that um, we don't only we don't have really jurisdiction to do anything about this really. Yeah. We 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 can't. If we allow it, 
then we're setting a, a, our own precedent, precedent. But that is not good for us because this is a development that hasn't wasn't a council development. This is a private company that developed the site. So, so could they put um, control parking? Could they apply for that? Is there a way around doing it that way? But then those position, those extra cars wouldn't be allowed to be parked there, would they? So that would make it reduce the car parking to what it's meant to be. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Fine. I hope you understand that. Do you understand? That? Yeah. Good. Okay. Councillor Davis, and then Councillor. Yeah. So this is this gives me a headache even yeah. reading the papers. <laughs> so I've got a headache. I feel sorry for you guys. Um, so who who owns the road? St Andrews Development Organisation. So sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So so we have no jurisdiction. So we can't fix a pothole on that road. No. Nope. Let's. No. So we we can't we we legally can't pay, pay even if we voted to do that we legally couldn't paint lines on that road. No. No. So then I'm I'm unfortunately it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a just think of it as this lovely anomaly in the whole system of planning that has allowed this to come to us. I'm I'm so sorry guys but there's there's nothing that we physically can do. No. I think, I've, I've I think got to go with officers' recommendations. There's no point in toiling it over, and I'd, recomm I'd recommend that the applicant lobby the owner of the site to take action. We have, we have no, uh, we can't physically paint the white lines. No. We we have no control over the road. It it no. shouldn't have come in. No. With the greatest uh, respect, it shouldn't have come in. I'll let Ed come. Let me let yeah. Ed, let officers come back to you, telling you why it's here first. <laughs> That's your question, by the way. Yeah. yeah go on. So planning consent is required for the additional parking, and it, in planning terms, it's additional parking over and above what was consented. So it does require planning consent for those changes, but the council cannot enforce the parking on the site or be the one that paints the white lines. Yeah, go on. Planning consent surely should have come from the landowner. No, it doesn't work that way. No. I can I can do a planning application on your house. I don't need your consent. That's the law. The law states that I can do it on anybody's house here. If I want, if wanted to waste to cut the ground, I could start putting planning applications on your property. The question is, is that I think as, as a committee, we have to then pass it back to you guys, with all due respect, and say, speak to the owners of the site. I think the better way of doing it is. I know you like your green space, but I think that would be a lot safer in the long run to have those areas. There is some room there. I can see that on some of the photos you could probably get an extra maybe three, maybe four spaces on there. I'm not sure, but uh, that's up to you guys to go back to the, the owners there. Councillor Gale, I haven't forgotten you. Please, what's your question? Um, thank you, Chair. I know that on occasion um, the committees went against officers' recommendation for, for different reasons. Um, so... We don't have any sort of legal weight here to, to, to go either way. We could go against. But um, even if we, let's say that we, we want to have not as many as requested, but fewer spaces, if we were to agree that, that there would still need the planning consent for, for any amount of spaces? Yeah, then that would be a different application. So then that application would have to be additional. So we can't change it to say well you can have two there and one there we can't do that we we have to look at the application as a whole and it's at this moment officers are telling us that it's dangerous so i would i could always go on the side when it's that someone says it's dangerous to me to go on the side of caution i do sympathize with residents i do understand what you're going for the london plan is useless i better not say any more than that otherwise i get into trouble so um we need to stick to what we can do here, um, so officers, of, as Councillor Davis has probably proposed already, that we go with officers' recommendation. Councillor Mand and then Councillor Singh. Just got a minor comment. Like uh, you've said, Chair, uh, we do have the sympathy of, of, of the residents because if I was a resident there as well, it, it seems like Councillor Davis said it, it seems a very tricky one in, on, on paper. But I um, would like, and I'm not sure 
um, how this would work is if, if the applications come to our committee, um, if we could request the officers to work with the residents if they wanted to, to come to some sort of um, sort of like an, a device given to the residents on what they can do. Because if we can't paint any white lines on there, but I'm sure as residents, um, they're not experts on planning. So if our officers could guide them in terms of who they could lobby and, and what kind of approach they could take, I think that would be beneficial because, like we said, we, we, we're here to, for, um, here to stick up for our residents. I think, I think we have to be very careful there. I have given the solution. Um, it's for them now to go to the owners to, because they've done it on other parts of the site, if I'm correct. So, and um, so th that's for them now to go to them and say, and then they'll come back. They'll come back to us again with these new bays because there's a demand, and then that we look at that application when it comes. Is that okay, Get I've got one final. Uh, if that that road, the, the dimensions are never going to change, etc. Is it ever worth it for the residents to ever come back with, with, with a proposal if, if those dimensions are never going to change? With the greens for the actual photograph of the site. Is there any leeway for them in terms of the, the, the aerial one? See, well, if you know, that one's a perfect example. You see where the mini is there? You could probably get another. You could probably get a bay this side where the Mercedes is, and you could probably get another bay on the other side. Mm. That's what they have to go back and do. Okay. So that won't affect the, the shared pathway. But that's, you know, and please, what I'm saying is not that that will happen and that will be agreed on this committee. It's just my interpretation of the situation. So that's what I'd suggest. That would be what I would suggest. Have I done anything wrong yet? Jimmy, are you looking at me? No? I'm fine? Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm a, I'm I was going to say is that uh, there's, in there, there's one reason for refusal, but there's two parts about safety yeah. and, and numbers yeah. as well. So it's, it's it, finding the numbers someplace else more safely, you still have the issue of the, no, of the, of the numbers. Yeah, exactly. But we can, we, we can, as a committee, we can overturn that. We have that right. Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, officers. Uh, my main concern is health and safety. Yeah. So I agree. if we allow the parking, then uh, it's really difficult for the emergency vehicles. Yeah. So elderly people, like um, Dr. Uh, Ellen, he already explained everything. Okay, Councillor. Do you want to second that, Councillor? Yes. Who? Me? Ed? Yeah, of course, Ken. Sorry. Um, Ed, you wanted to. You want to say something? No, one of you, I don't mind. Okay. Otherwise, I'll go back to Councillor Tubidar. I'll go to Tubidar first and you can come. Okay, fine. So, let's say. So, go. So who's going to take it? Ed or Katie? Go on. Who's going to be brave? Okay. No, it's okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. So, okay, so we're proposing seconds with officer's recommendation. Can I show hands those in favour with officer's recommendation? That's unanimous. I do hope we did try and help, but, you know, our hands are tied slightly. Okay, so that concludes all our petition items. Can we ask... Uh, do you mind asking Councillor Bennett if he can come back in for us? He's out there. Oh, there, there we go. It's a pity in some way that you weren't allowed to be here because you could have added so much more to it because you live on one of the sites next to it. But anyway, hey-ho. Okay. That's the way it is. Right, so Ed, you're going to do item 10 for me? Thank you, Chair. Um, this really is a straightforward uh, item. So item 10 of the agenda is a, a section 72 application to amend the Austin Road estate regeneration proposals that were granted consent in September 2022. I'll take you through the slides. Um, it's got a very long description. Essentially that is because of, we have to include the full definition of the original application, but it's a very minor change to increase the parapet height by 50 centimetres. So here's the location plan, the constraints plan, the site location plan, the site plan, and I'll just point out, um, I hope you can see actually on that. That isn't working. Oh well, never mind. Um, so this is the plant area. This is additional plant that's proposed on the roof, and it's this parapet 
that will increase by 50 centimetres in height. And this is the northern elevation, the elevation that would be most impacted by this change. So scrolling through is the east elevation, west elevation, south elevation. This is the internal view from the courtyard, and then a section. Now this hopefully explains just how minor this change is that's proposed. So there's a very slight increase in the parapet height um, and that additional plant that would contain a, um, an air source heat pump. So again, this is the west elevation shows that minor change. So the height of the phases increases as you move to the south um, towards the canal. So this is actually one of the lower phases. So a minor height increase here isn't really an issue in terms of um, aircraft safety. There's a site photo of it as existing. Now, I've been on site several times. Uh, it's all hoarding at the moment because there's a lot of demolition going on. This is the, the last photo I could find. I'll admit it's from Google Street View um, of the site before it was developed. And there's a bird's eye view. Okay. So, the current application seeks to amend the original consent for the detailed first phase to increase the parapet height by 50 centimetres. The parapet height needs to be increased slightly to provide guarding to the roof level uh, to comply with Park K and the building regulations um, to be a minimum of 1.1 metre above finished roof level. Members of the roof increase the overall height by 50 centimetres. Um, Heathrow, Nats and the GLA have confirmed no objections to proposals. There's no comments on the application that have been received and no addendum matters, so the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice and quick. Councillor Davis and Councillor Bennett. Uh, thank you, Chairman. This is a really minor amendment um, to what's going to be a great project for the Haystown, uh, Haystown area. I'm happy to go with officer's recommendation on this one. Okay, so propose it. Councillor Bennett. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the only thing I noticed in there was I didn't like the colour of the balconies, which is completely irrelevant to uh, this committee, so I'm happy to second officer's recommendation for approval. Funny you said about colour about the colours. I don't, can we make sure that we condition the colour of those parapets at the top? Because one looks very grey and one looks blended that you can't really notice it. So I wouldn't want it to be noticeable if you understand what I mean. If you look at your drawings, but you go back to the drawing, you'll see that that one, no go back one, that one's like like grey and then you go to the next one, oh no, the other way, and that's dark grey, that's black actually. But do you want to say? So you're referring to the rooftop plant? Yeah. Okay, so the, the uh, conditions attached to the original consent are carried forward through a Section 73 unless they've already been discharged. Okay. So there was a materials condition attached to that consent. Okay. Which, which, which one is it, though? That's sort of a question I'm asking. Because one is black and one is light grey. Well, the, the, the final details would be determined through the discharge of the details. Okay, fine. Condition. So we can... We can sit to do, do that now, or do you, we leave it till... There will be a future application. Okay, fine. That, that All right. The, the details I'm are overstepping, I beg your pardon. I am proposed <laughs> and seconded, so can I have a show of hands, those in favour? Lovely. It's agreed. Liz? Now, item 11. We've got, we've got musical chairs here. It looks bad that we can't afford two computers, <laughs> but never mind. Oh, and you'll be going to the subs bench in a minute. So. Right, Katie, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Okay, so item 11 is for an application at Highview Farm on New Year's Green Lane. Um, so the site itself is a, an existing green waste composting operations. Um, so they process the green waste from um, clients such as local authorities, um, a, a few commercial ones, but it's not open to the public. And so what they're proposing to do is to increase the site area of where they'll do the green waste, the maturation, um, hard standing, where they'll um, create composting windrows. So, um, and also as part of that, there'll be an extra storage container, a um, couple of site offices, which is a, wealth, a welfare building, which is a toilet block, um, Weybridge office, and some uh, two additional holding tanks for leachate and also a generator. But it'll become clearer when I show you the plans. So this is the wider site location plan. So the entire um, waste um, operations is the areas that you see there in the sort of peachy colours. 
So the site to the north of New Year's Green um, Lane is the one that has the open win the open composting, open air composting windrows, and the site that you see to the south is where they do the um, in vessel composting. So that's like the mixed green waste um, and food waste. Um, it's a little bit more odorous, so it's done in in containers essentially. Um, so this application site, well, the entire site is part of the operations from West London Composting Limited. This application pertains only to the site outlined in red in this plan here. So it's the area to the north, which is the where the windrows are. So what's being proposed, so if we go, actually I'll just go through a couple. This is the smaller site, site to the north. As you can see, it's also in green belt. And if we go to the bird's eye view plan here, you can see the existing um, windrows there. So what is being proposed is the area essentially to go a little bit north and a little bit east um, to enlarge it so you can get some more windrows on there, some um, more hard standing area for composting, open air composting, and then also there is a biodiversity net gain site shown there on the uh, top left hand corner. Okay, so this is um, just the proposed site layout again, so you can see here the additional um, additional two leachate tanks and then it's actually at the south of the site near to the road is where the additional um, welfare office, Weybridge and Weybridge office is being proposed. So on this plan as well you can also see the windrows themselves, um, they'll be two metres in height so this is a condition that's been brought over from the original planning permission, so that's being maintained, they're not getting any larger. So part of um, the reason for requiring a larger site is to comply with uh, new environment agency uh, requirements with regards to um, managing com open composting sites, um, particularly in respect to fire, uh, fire risk as well. So to provide some more space in between them as well, um, the site is getting larger and also um, there is a central government led, potentially it's up in the air at the moment, um, move towards um, processing more green waste, um, just basically um, collecting food and green waste separate so it doesn't have to go to the in-vessel um, composting. Okay, so. This is just uh, some sections of the proposed funds around the exterior of the site and I've also just got some key views here where it just shows um, the indicative heights of where they would be. So as you can see they would largely be, they would largely essentially be subsumed within the wider area um, and they're landscaped as well. Is that one there? Okay, these are um, plans of the deposed tanks, also a store, welfare unit, office unit, Weybridge, but they're actually um, the mobile as well, so this is pictures of them um, on the site currently. Oh, and there's just some, a couple more site photos here of, this is um, the maturation site and um, screening taking place. And this is a picture of the window to give you an idea of how tall they are, what they look like. Um, and this one's um, currently being turned. Okay, and there's just some more slide photos. Um, so officers have assessed the proposal. It is in green belt, but um, there has been uh, a, a pretty solid case for um, an appropriate development within the green belt, which has also been accepted by the GLA as well. Um, so officers recommend approval subject to conditions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the biodiversity area that's near the woodland, are they, what are they actually doing? Is it, does it mean they're just letting it be grass or actually doing something with that? Um, there is a proposed planting plan. I should have <laughs> Sorry to throw a curveball at you. Okay, so there is. Um, so the d details are going to be, I guess, decided at a later date. It is proposed for a scrub area. I um, don't know how much to go too much back into it. It's, it's, it's part of 
um, I guess HS2, as also, as you'll know, is yeah, in the yeah, surrounding yeah. area. So it's a little bit of... Um, bit of both. Yeah. Okay. That's fitting fair. in with surrounding development as well. Great. So, Councillor Singh. Councillor, come ahead. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And thank you, officers. I think uh, is everything okay we need this, so I propose officer recommendation. Thank you. So I'm proposed. Councillor Davies. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think I think this is m much needed, as we know that I'm assuming the site that's currently on is out has outgrown its need. That's why we're doing it. Um, I think the report was very in depth and give me enough information, so I'm happy to go with uh, the second. Okay, lovely. So I'm proposing Councillor Gartner. Thank you, Chair. I just have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, about the the amount the tonnage that is being passed through the site in the last 12 months was it um, did they achieve the maximum capacity or was it below that was I think 75,000 um, I, I don't really know I don't really regard that as a planning point but I'll ask officers if you know but we're, we're looking to the audience <laughs> I can find out Okay, so you can just if you can email it to officers and they'll participate around thing. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, I think we should feel comfortable that it's green waste, and we will get those figures to you at a later date. And I think comfortable in the fact that I wouldn't have thought they would ask for it if there wasn't a demand. I think that'd be fair to say, wouldn't it? Yeah. Just that I wanted to ascertain that the vehicular movement won't be increased in numbers just will oh, stay okay. that's, as that's it's a different, uh, That's a different question. That's, yeah, that's a good question. Actually. Um, no, it won't. So there is the tonnage that you're referring to that passes through the combined sites. That's remaining as existing, so as conditions. The conditions are being pulled through. And same with the um, numbers of vehicle movements to and from the site. That isn't changing at all. Okay. Any other questions? No? So I'm proposed and seconded. Show of hands, those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, item 12, Garage Court, 66 to 74. That's Owen. Yeah, that's fine. I don't know until you take time. It's handy. I can read lips. <laughs> No, 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 no. Oh, oh that's all right. Just one thing. That's one way to do it. <laughs> We got Mr. Tubidar at the end there. He's at IT. Yeah. IT. <laughs> if you go to the go to the squares down the bottom near the search thing, click that. At the very bottom, you've got those win uh, windows, search, and then there's little mm -hmm. like ladder. Click that. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, okay. Yeah, for some reason it's not. Sorry? It's <laughs> It's all right. We've got Councillor Davis who can sort it out. Well, it's, 
cruising around there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Well, down counts the days. Well, the other one's fine. Do the other one as you did before, dear. Yeah, just pull that across there. Look. Can you move those slides anyway? Yeah, of course you can. There you go. Well done. A round of applause. Take a bow, Councillor Davis. Don't speak too slow. No, it's all right. You know, you have no choice but to be quick now. <laughs> The next item is uh, item 12. Uh, it involves, uh, I suppose, it's garages to the rear of 66 to 74 Farmers Land Road. Uh, it involves the demolition of existing single storey garages and construction of four new two bed, two storey houses and associated parking and landscaping. So, this is the location plan. Um, you can see uh, Joel. Road is or Joel Street is directly west. Um, the entrance is uh, to the south, um, and that's the bird's eye view of the site. And this is the aerial phot photograph of the wider site context. Um, you see a mixture of uh, um, semi detached, and there's actually terrace housing and also purpose-built masonettes, uh, Aston Court. So there is the constraint site, um, directly south, uh, slightly outside the setting would be um, East Coast Village Conservation Area. Um, there's also a Grade 2 uh, listed building, Ivy Farmhouse and Cherry Cottage to the west. That's your existing block plan. Um, it's hard to make out, but the, the black shaded areas, the garages, that's them on site. And that's the existing east elevation. And that is the south elevation, north elevation, and the existing views. Um, so you, you can see the existing garages on the right hand side from the aerial and also the um, residential properties in the background. So the proposed block plan, we did get amendments uh, during the course of the application just to reduce the size of the single storey element. This was in order to achieve uh, better amenity space for the private residents. Um, the knock-on effect is it imp makes the development further away from the neighbouring properties. So that's your ground floor plan. Uh, you have one bedroom on, on the ground floor and uh, communal living space. Um, your first floor plan, um, in terms of the first floor plan, I would point out that there's no windows on the rear elevation facing the residents on Farmsland Road. So this is the proposed east elevation front uh, elevation of the site. Um, they've gone for a contemporary design um, which we feel suits the MU style development. This is your site eleva or south elevation um, gable and it, um, that is set back um, uh, between, I suppose it, it varies between 15 to 20 metres uh, from the residents on 62 to 66 farmlands. And this is the west elevation of the site, the rear elevation um, with no windows. There is a, a green roof on the single storey element just to give it a bit more a visual relief and that's the north elevation. 
So this is what the uh, Provost Mew's view would look like. Um, if you see on the proposed aerial, it is uh, sloped away from the residence of 61 Farmsland Road. Um, and also, um, I suppose the gable design is uh, uh, follows features within the area. And this is the 3D imagery. Front elevation, you can see uh, quite deep reveals on the windows, which and quite warm brickwork and tiling, which uh, makes, uh, I suppose, quite a, a decent design and uh, sympathetic to the local character. And that's the rear elevation with the green roof, um, and also you see the gardens there of uh, the neighbouring properties. Proposed sections, again, uh, separation there, you see the two-storey element is quite a distance from the rear properties of 62 to 66. So these are pictures taken from Wilshire Lane and the entrance to farmlands, so at the junction of Wilshire Lane, uh, and then the one on the left bottom left is uh, the entrance towards the uh, um, garages and then on the right is the front elevations of the neighbouring properties. This is your existing site. On the right hand side you see 61 in the background and this just gives you an idea the the current state of the garages which are in a bit of disrepair. Um, and this would be the site taken from Joel Street. Um, so, you know, there are quite a lot of trees uh, in the vicinity that gives a level of screening. Right, in terms of design, um, officers are satisfied that the design is sympathetic to the actual uh, area. Um, it is a, a low rise muse development. Um, and contemporary style, which we feel is acceptable in this um, this setting. Um, in terms of amenity, the site responds positively to its location. Um, a daylight sunlight analysis was carried out. Um, it showed that uh, 104 of the windows did not breach the 25 degree, and the remaining eight windows. Uh, um, past debris testing, uh, therefore uh, achieving um, uh, levels above the 27 uh, required by um, uh, debris guidance. Um, as such, officers are satisfied that there would be a good uh, daylight sunlight uh, retained for neighbouring uh, dwellings. Um, also, in terms of uh, sense of enclosure, uh, in the first floor elements have been set back. Um, uh, s significant distance. Um, we feel that, given the setbacks on, on, on at first floor level, this would uh, um, prevent um, any uh, sense of enclosure to the residents. Um, overall, uh, we feel the standards of accommodation for uh, adjoining residents would be um, uh, maintained. In terms of the uh, overall. Uh, Living conditions, um, the proposed uh, um, two beds would, would provide a good quality accommodation for future occupants. Uh, each habitable room has sufficient sunlight and daylight and dual aspect. And we have managed to get a, a private amenity space that complies with the local standards. No objections have been raised from our highways officers in terms of layouts. There is provision for four car parking spaces and a condition securing a car parking management plan. We also have conditions on cycle and waste management details that have been included in the landscaping condition. In terms of trees, uh, tree protection conditions and landscaping conditions have been added to ensure the trees are protected during the construction phase. Overall, uh, given the uh, 
um, tightness of the site. Uh, officers feel the the design responds positively uh, and uh, has no negative impact on neighbouring uh, properties. And as such, uh, recommend approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, Councillor Bennett. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I like the term visual relief. I think we all need a bit of that in our lives. Um, just a question on access. Are these houses being built on Joel Street or farmlands? Farmland. Farmland. This is, is probably not for this committee, but maybe more of an action around, uh, is it possible to have the road, that section as a separate road name? Just looking at the map around farmlands, it's this sprawling sort of development that goes in every which direction. I'm just... As, as somebody who lives on a development that is a bit like a maze where signage is not very clear it is very confusing for delivery drive, drivers okay, yeah. if you say you live on farmlands you could go left right round the corner back I just the people who are going to live here they so would you nominate Higgins Drive or something like that of Higgins Hill <laughs> yeah um, but I, I don't know if, if, which department in the council would consider that I guess it's Ed. Ed. <laughs> Ed's going to do it. <laughs> uh, it's not me, but uh, we do have an officer who is involved in street naming and numbering. And that's more to do with um, emergency vehicles and making sure it's a clear access mm. point, which is why you don't have two roads named very similar and close to each other. You shouldn't have. Um, we can certainly raise it with that department. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very good suggestion. Do you want to propose that as well? Or you um, yeah, I, d I just wanted to say as well, the garages look really sorry. I, d I did have a question around how many of them are currently used. So is, is no. the garage is pretty vacant as it is. Um, uh, uh, from my understanding, they're all vacant, um, and that was uh, clarified by the planning officer. Okay. Very no, no, very good use then of, of turning redundant garages into to new homes. I'm, mm. I'm happy to propose we move officers' okay. recommendation for approval. Okay, Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think it's everything clear, the officer, they explained everything, the road, the trees, or everything. So I'm second. Thank you. So I'm proposed and seconded. I think they're lovely little things, actually. They've done really well, designed very well. Uh, yeah, so proposed and seconded. All those in favour of the officer recommendation? There we go. Now we have a change of chair. There's a substitute, the, the striker coming in for the winning goals for the cup final. All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, so item 13 relates to Yedding Infant School, Carlion Road, Hayes. The application seeks planning permission for the demolition of existing single-storey buildings and the erection of a new single-storey kitchen and dining hall. Uh, in terms of location, the development site is on the south side of Carlion Road. The surrounding area is residential. In terms of constraints, as you can see on the plan in front of you, the two main school buildings on the site are locally listed buildings. Part of the site is also within flood zone two, and as you can see in green, the green belt is to the north of the site. Uh, here's an existing site plan for the school. Uh, the building in red in the middle is the one to be demolished. That's the existing CAF of the school, and the other building also outlined in red to the left or west is a kitchen, which is also to be demolished and replaced by these new kitchen and dining facilities for the school users. Here's a proposed site plan. In the middle of the proposed site plan, you can see the new building. As you can see, it's significantly larger than the previous building, allowing for increased capacity for the users of the school. Here's an existing ground floor plan and a proposed ground floor plan. As you can see, the building is significantly bigger, allowing for that larger capacity of students and better management of students' time. Here's a roof plan existing and proposed. Um, the school will be putting in some solar panels to improve the energy efficiency of the building. Here's the existing and proposed front elevation. Uh, as you can see, the building is a little bit more contemporary in terms of its design. Here are the rear elevation. These are the side elevations. For clarity, it's the one on the bottom left, which is being replaced. That's the new building, and it's the bottom picture on the south, sorry, at the bottom, which is the new building. Here's the proposed parking plan and foot plan for the site. Uh, the new foot plan is outlined in yellow, and that's going to show 
that the dining hall will be accessible to the users of both schools, so that's both Yedding Junior School and Yedding Infant School. Um, the grey area in the middle of the site is a drop-off point, which will be allow parents to access the site, I guess, in a safer manner than they do already, and some additional parking spaces are being provided, which will provide disabled parking spaces. Uh, here's a 3D image of what the building might look like when it's constructed. Uh, as I said, the building's in the middle of the site, and because it's in the middle of the site, uh, you wouldn't see it from the street scene, so it would have no visual impact. Here's a bird's eye view of the plan. Here's the entrance of the Yedding Infant School at the moment. This is the driveway which would lead to the parking spaces which are going to be altered and the new drop-off point. Here's the existing car park and the location of the new safe drop-off point as well as where the new paths will be and the parking alterations. Uh, in the middle of the site to the left-hand side, so the building with the brown roof, that's the existing uh, kitchen which is going to be demolished and replaced by this new facility. And here's the existing CAF that students are using at the moment. As you can see, it's in a state of disrepair. It's not been upheld very well. Um, it's quite an old building, so they've done well to keep it up for this amount of time. Again, here's another image of the CAF. Uh, they've tried to make it look pretty. Um, definitely have been a good attempt. Uh, this is the playground of the site. This is going to be retained as existing, so there'll be no impact on the playground or loss of play space. Here are some internal images of the school cafeteria at the moment. As you can see, it's probably not well insulated as they're using these little heaters to heat the space, so uh, I'm sure students would like a new building, which is more energy efficient and better insulated. Uh, here again is the existing CAF, an internal image, and here's an existing gate between the two sites, so that's between the junior school and the infant school, which will allow students from both schools to access this new facility. So uh, just to conclude on this one, uh, the existing dining facilities are in poor condition and are fit for replacement. The proposed development would provide the users of both schools with improved dining facilities supporting their function. The principle of improving and extending the dining hall has already been established by previous permissions at the site which were granted but were not implemented. The proposal would cause no harm to the local highways network, neighbouring amenities or the appearance of the area and for the reasons outlined in this presentation and the committee report is recommended that planning permission be granted subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Hayden. Uh, Councillor Davison, Councillor Singh, Councillor Mandler. Uh, thank you, Chairman. As always, um, I always have a question or two. Um, construction management plan. Um, we've put restricted hours in there. Can I just confirm that that is no deliveries between the hours of 9.30 and 3.30 or is that the only delivery times between 9.30 and 3.30? I'll look at the condition and get back to you in two seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Um, yes, my second one is, I, it may be in here, I may, have, I may have missed it. I can't see any asbestos management report. Sorry, in response to the question, it would only be between those hours. So we're proposing to still allow deliveries when the school exits at three, three between 3 and 3.30? We're, we're allowing HGVs to be down that road at the same time or exiting the site at the same time the school children are leaving. We can put a condition in that to cover that anyway. Yeah, if we can just look at adjusting that time, maybe by... Well, no, during... I mean, obviously, when it's when the school's closed during half-term and summer, yeah. we can carry on at no all time. It's just, obviously, when school's in operation, we'll put it in. Yeah, the condition can be appropriately reworded to allow for people to leave the school safely without in coming into contact with construction. Okay, you can bring that to me. Yeah, bring yeah, it back to me and I'll sign out. Okay, um, and, and also, the specialists would yeah, I can't, see the, I can't see it. It may be in there. I'm sure it's in the, in the building, Riggs, but anyway, I just couldn't see it. And with the age of that building, I'm yeah. expecting an <laughs> air raid tower to be going off, <laughs> sort of thing, so I would expect it to be some okay. in that building. Uh, just in terms of asbestos, I think that's separate legislation, okay. um, but we can look to uh, add an informative um, yeah. to allow them to, to make sure they're in compliance. Yeah, okay. the location, yeah. I think, would be okay. good. Okay, so we've got an informative. Help the thing. Uh, thank you, Chair and officers. I think uh, if we look at the old canteen and the new canteen, I think the kids, they need it. Yeah. And uh, also the parents are, should be... Happy when they see that development there. Yeah. You're going to propose so it? I propose this uh, officer. Okay, Councillor Singh, you proposed. Councillor Mand? Um, 
just wanted to say I actually studied in this school, so um, I probably sat in those canteens. So uh, I was tempted to vote to, uh, to refuse just because of a bit of history being erased. But, um, <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll be delighted to second it. I think it's a welcome addition well, to the school. Well done. What 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 um. I've forgotten the word, never mind. I'm on, I'm no Monday, no, I can't remember. Never mind, let's move on. Uh, so it's proposed and seconded. Can I show hands, those in favour? Thank you, that's anonymous. Anonymous, anonymous, anonymous. Uh, okay, item 14, Hayden. Okay, so just before beginning, I'd like to draw members' attention to the addendum on this item. There was an objection received from one of the neighbours. The objection has been addressed in the addendum and has also been addressed in the officer's report. So item 14 refers to the garages to the rear of 15 Ash Grove. Application seeks planning permission for the demolition of four existing garages and the erection of two terraced dwellings with associated car parking spaces and private gardens. Um, the development site is located on the corner of Juniper Way and Ash Grove. In terms of constraints, there are no constraints to the development site. However, the rear of the site is on potentially, lo uh, potentially contaminated land. Here is the existing site plan. As you can see, to the west we have the four garage spaces. Uh, the front of the site is actually a bit of a grass verge, which I'll show you in photos later on. Here we have the existing elevations. As you can see, the four garages and that property that you can see in the image is number 31 Ash Grove. Here's the proposed site plan. As you can see, we're going to have one car parking space coming off of, off of Juniper Way and one coming off of Ash Grove. We've also got the main dwellings in the middle of the site as well as their amenity spaces. Here's the proposed ground floor plan. Here's a proposed first floor plan. And here's a proposed roof plan. Um, in terms of the visuals, the development would be a little bit more contemporary than the existing buildings at the site, but as I'll show you in the photos later on, that might not necessarily be a bad thing. Here's a bird's eye view of the plant. Here's the existing terrace block, so this is where our two new dwellings would be sited on the end to the right-hand side. Here is the grass verge and garages which will be replaced, i.e. the development site. Here are the existing garages which would be demolished. As you can see from the photos, people park in front of them, so a lot of them can't be used anyway. The parking forecourt in front of the garages is also quite cramped. Here is a view from the site from Uniper Way Service Road toward the development site. Here is a street scene showing an array of properties of different design. So you can see we've got gable ends, we've got flush elevations. We've also got these, um, I guess, older, more period properties in the area. And uh, a lot was raised during the process of the application regarding the parking situation at the site. As you can see from this image, people park on the grass verge, they park on the side of the roads. This is quite a hazardous area if you're coming out of those areas because of the way that people park and use this piece of land. And uh, for that reason, it might not necessarily be a bad thing in replacing it, which is the proposal is trying to do. So to conclude on this one, um, at present, people park on the grass verge at the site, which harms the appearance of the area and endangers road users and pedestrians. The proposed development would alleviate the issue by replacing the land with houses. Concerns were raised during the process of the application regarding the loss of parking caused by the demolition of the garages and forecourt. However, as mentioned in the committee report, the garages are substandard for parking modern vehicles. They are predominantly unoccupied, as such their loss would not result in any additional on-road parking. Furthermore, a transport assessment has been submitted in support of the development showing that adequate parking space exists on surrounding roads should any of the development lead to roadside parking. So taking into consideration these points, the development is considered to have no adverse highways impact. The development would add a new family, two, well, one new family-sized home and another house to the borough's housing supply, which is much welcomed. And overall, for the reasons outlined in this presentation and the committee report, it is recommended that planning permission be granted for the proposed development subject to conditions. Thank, Thank you, Hayden. Chair. Okay, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Chairman. I, I just with that image on the screen, just want to challenge: Are we really comfortable that there's adequate parking provision in the area? People are parking on the pavement, no, the, on the grass verge. Yeah, I, I, I had this. And I had this conversation with officers, are. and that is a, some sort of business going on there. So that is not residential parking. Some of those car, okay. some of the plates. If you saw those, 
Fiesta's had their number plates removed and stuff like that. So they're using it because okay. it's off the highway. They don't. They're not liable for torn vehicles and stuff like that. Um, Maybe could we just take an action that that, that we flag that either to the wall councillors or to ASB in terms of I think enforcement. I, I think it'll be an improvement. I, I mean, I, I know where you, I know where you're going with it. And when I saw that, I was concerned. But um, further investigation. Anyway, uh, uh, Dr. Tiddy will tell you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, in the course of writing up the highway comments for this application, we spotted that most of the vi all of the vehicles are Toyotas, and I spoke to colleagues in planning enforcement, and um, it appears that there being a business being run from the main road, which I'm... Is it? Jupiter. Uh, Ashgrove. 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 So, yes, that is uh, in hand. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Also, I'd just like to say, officers, make sure that the sign, you know, is redistributed in the right place, otherwise it's going to be someone's driveway. So I don't want to be able to drive in that. Yes, Councillor, you want to finish? Sorry, yes. Just on the second point, I d just the same <coughs> request as for the last application with garage demolition is around the road name, just where you've got a road that has a clear kind of trajectory, and we're now building houses on what would be an offshoot that isn't naturally part of that road, is just whether we would... The front like doors consider. would be exactly there so it'd still be on Ash Grove technically the numbering would be an issue but yeah so probably be A something B something I'm not that particular <laughs> I'll leave you to do the numbering thank you you're proposing that Councillor Bennett based on those answers yes I'm happy to thank you propose you said Councillor Davis um, yeah can I just double check none of them garages are occupied at the moment are they no, none of the garages are occupied. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, I'm happy to second and go with officers' recommendations. Brilliant. So, proposed and seconded. Can I have a show of hands? All those in favour of the officers' recommendation and subject to uh, the amendment and everything else. Yeah, agreed? It's all agreed. Thank you. Thank you very much, committee. Thank you, officers, for coming out tonight and uh, have a safe trip home. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>